Okay, we're ready, Councillor. Great, thank you very much. Um, Happy New Year and welcome to the first Children and Young People Scrutiny Commission meeting of 2021. Um, first for some housekeeping, although this is a virtual meeting, it is still a formal meeting of Hackney Council and all the usual constitutional requirements of council meetings apply. I would like to remind members and officers present that this meeting is being held in public and is being broadcast live via the internet. The rights of the press and public to record and film the meeting will be apply and media representatives may be in attendance or viewing the live stream. Just a few points in terms of operability. Unless you are speaking, please keep, keep your mic muted. If you'd like to speak, raise your hand or indicate in the chat section to get my attention. For those of you who have dialed into the meeting, um, please take yourself off mute and indicate verbally that you wish to speak. Um, keeping your mic on helps me to identify who would like to speak. Criminal investigations into the cyber attack on the council are, are continuing, therefore it is not possible to discuss issues pertaining to this. Members of the commission and attendees are thanked for your understanding in this matter. Thank you for your patience. Let's start the meeting. So moving on to the first item, we've got a really packed agenda today. So can I ask people to be as, as succinct and brief as, as possible um, while also trying to cover as, as much as I'm, I'm sure we all feel is necessary this evening. Um, the first item is apologies for absence. Are there any apologies for absence or lateness? Uh, Shooter Shake has given his apologies, as has Councillor Sharon Patrick. Okay, thank you very much. Um, any other apologies? No. Moving on to item two, urgent items. In response to the announcement of the third national lockdown to curb trans transmission of COVID-19, the Commission has requested an urgent update from the Director of Education and Director of Children and Family Service. The urgent updates will be taken after item three, declarations of interest. Declaration, um, item three, declarations of interest. Do members have any declarations of interest? Uh, yes, I do. I'm a, I'm a teacher and a member of the EU. Thank you, Councillor Shawhan. Jo? I'm a governor at the Thomas Abney Primary School. Any other um, council pieces? Yeah, uh, yes, I'm, I'm the governor at uh, the Garden School in Hackney. Do you have any others? No. Okay, in which case we're going to now move on to um, urgent item, the update from the Director of Education and Director of Children and Family Service. We will now take the um, urgent updates. Um, I would like to start by welcoming Annie Gammon and Annie Coyle to the meeting. A special welcome to Annie Coyle as this is her first EYP meeting as Interim Director of Children and Families. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank you both and officers across both your directorates for your tireless efforts to educate and safeguard the children and young people of our borough during these most testing and uncertain times. Um, okay, can I hand over first to Annie Gammon for updates on education, please? Yes, good evening everybody and I wish you the very best for 2021. Um, the, I'm going to start off with schools and you will know that probably primary schools in particular went through about five different plans of what they were going to be providing in those first few days and last couple of days of 2020, first few days of 2021. We are now settled following the announcement of the lockdown on the 4th of January um, into schools providing on-site education for vulnerable children, of which there is a slightly wider definition than there was before, and children of critical workers, while providing remote education for uh, the majority of children. Um, they have been able to do that probably in a much with building on the experience, uh, skills and knowledge and the work that they've done over the past few months. Um, they're in a much stronger position to do that than they were in April. And certainly the uh, examples I have heard have indicated that the children um, are getting a, a stronger offer in terms of remote education. What we also know is that there are more children on site than in the previous lockdown. Um, so in some cases, schools thinking very carefully about health and safety may have had to limit numbers. We have given them advice on prioritising that. 
Um, one of the things that secondary schools in particular had been getting ready for um, when they were expecting more children to be back earlier was testing children. And you will have heard about the rollout of the lateral flow tests um, to secondary schools. And indeed, I think secondary schools were getting messages about that all through the Christmas holidays. Um, with the lockdown, the urgency and scale of that has reduced somewhat, but secondary schools still do have all the equipment for lateral flow testing and are working with the children they have on site and the staff who are on site to set up those testing regimes. They're being very well supported by that with public health and the school nurse system. There's also a pilot of that running or about to start in 10 of our primary schools and two early year settings. Um, and certainly the feedback from schools that had been early pilots before Christmas was that it certainly gave reassurance to staff, particularly with the new strain of the virus, which certainly appears to have a, a number of people being asymptomatic. Um, testing is also available to our special schools. Our three special schools are all open with slightly redu well, with reduced numbers, but they are open and have been open from the beginning. Um, and our SEND transport workers are also able to access testing. So they are running uh, with smaller numbers on the buses. One of the areas where I would still say there is a resolution needed is around the early year settings. Um, from the 4th of January, the early year settings were told that they needed to be fully open. Uh, this is a real challenge given the health and safety issues um, and we know that young children cannot socially distance so we're asking our staff in early year settings or indeed staff in any early year settings to be with children with no particular limits on numbers beyond those ratios that are there already. Um, we did ask our maintained children's centres to take some time to sort out their health and safety and prioritise the vulnerable children and children of critical workers. Um, they are now opening more widely, but I think there is still an issue there and a tension because one of the things at the moment that early years uh, centres would normally be building up to is a January <laughs> census, which determines their funding based on how many children they have. Many children aren't going to the settings and the settings are kind of wanting to limit numbers anyway because of health and safety. Um, the council with Councillor Woodley, the Mayor, Councillor Bramble are all putting pressure on government to come to a resolution about that. And what we would like to see is that they revert to the previous number that the school or setting was being funded for. Um, one of the issues we've also dealing with in the local authority is our number of independent schools in the north of the borough. Um, you have a, a large number of children deemed vulnerable because they can't access remote learning and have large early year settings. So a significant number of children are attending those settings, um, which is causing a little bit of uh, local concern that there are too many children in. We have asked the registered independent schools for their risk assessments and are collecting those in and scrutinising them. Uh, we're also working with colleagues across the council, including with public health, to make sure we have a, both as robust and supportive uh, response to that as possible. Um, the, the digital access becomes important for remote learning. And again, I would say that schools are in a much stronger position. Almost all of them have received uh, devices from central government, although we are pushing to get more. And the borough scheme has also supported that, as well as schools funding. Um, back themselves. So I think we are in a stronger position, although I couldn't say that every child does have a device. Um, um, you'll know that exams have um, are going to be different for year 11 and year 13. We don't yet know what will be in place, but we know that teacher assessment will play a significant part. And the Key Stage 1 and Key Stage 2 SATs have been cancelled. Um, one of the things that's been in the news a lot today is about free school meals. Um, the government asked schools to provide for children who normally get free school meals in the first instance with a slightly vague promise that some money would follow but wasn't clear how much and when. So schools were really left with or have been left with three options. One was to provide um, hampers of food or hot meals which obviously of, there's some issues about collection and delivery. Another was to themselves buy vouchers from Tesco's or Asta or similar supermarkets 
and a third was to use the scheme used before the Eden Red scheme which the council is helping with centrally but the school still has to fund that at the moment there isn't any um, central funding I suspect uh, today's news will put pressure on the government to act quickly to resolve that but I hope to see that soon because I know that the solutions on offer at the moment probably aren't reaching every child um, we are working closely with education, working closely with um, the Children and Family Service, um, with Annie Coyle's service to look after people around the vulnerable children and to work closely together given some of the children we can't see who we'd normally see in school. I would say that the increased uptake and engagement with um, remote learning does mean that generally there is something live going on each day online for children so that they are uh, more in touch than perhaps was the case before but we still need to obviously make sure that every child is being seen during the week um, and I think that is uh, that's my update about education so I'm happy to take questions or hand straight over to Annie Coyle um Okay, uh, I think we might hand over to Annie Coyle first and then we'll take questions afterwards, please. Hello colleagues, really nice to meet you all this evening and so many faces I haven't met yet, so it's uh, it's really good to be here this evening. Um, <clears throat> I'll try and keep this brief because that's what we were asked to do, um, but just really to give you some assurance that um, the children's um, social care early help um, service priorities are about seeing our children, be that virtually or um, directly. Um, and, you know, clearly Hackney has had all of the learning from the from the other experience of this and uh, just really kind of building on that. We've got some really good guidance for our um, staff to be able to, to practice safely, um, to make sure that we know our staff that are uh, shielding or of other that we need to protect through the through the course of this process and um, but fundamentally who those children are that we, we need to see um, face to face so um, managing that kind of anxiety because they are out in the community uh, and going into family homes and making sure that we manage visits in a way that we haven't got staff going from one house to the next in, in terms of that whole virus cross contamination and all of that but our Visiting guidance to staff is uh, super clear about that. So, um, and we've had some good good feedback from them in relation uh, to that specific issue. Um, you know, I never endingly uh, am impressed by the Hackney direct workers to be able to see their children. And um, so, uh, it's really it's quite humbling and um, to watch their dedication to make sure that they know that their children are safe and well looked after. Um, I think quite impressively in terms of our disabled children's service um, I think in the last lockdown there was a, a sterling effort for um, every parent to be contacted um, at the time and just to kind of do that reach out in to our most vulnerable children uh, that's an exercise that will be completed again by the end of next Friday um, you know sometimes you don't know when people are struggling if they're not able to say that so the service was reaching in to, just to do that kind of double check um, and for our, our young Hackney colleagues, um, you know, they're always impressive about their go the extra mile in terms of our young people and being able to um, keep our young people safe. And there's a, um, an outreach service that's still um, alive despite um, the, the COVID challenges. And as I said, it's been really good today. We've had the vulnerable uh, children's group and um, that real connectivity between what our colleagues, uh, all of the wisdom that's held by our colleagues in education and then marrying that up with early help and um, and social care just so that we've got that real radar um, on those kind of silent children that we might be worried about so you know that's very much in, in train and um, and we were able to talk about some specific children over the last days too um, it, just the last few days I've seen that a slight drop in the um, referrals into the uh, first access and response team that's quite common across the country that's quite normal and um, in terms of you know our education colleagues are often our biggest referrers so uh, we intend to use that time wisely um, uh, if there is a bit of a, a, a lull albeit even if it's just for a couple of days it gives people a bit of breathing space and helps us to think about how do we mobilize staff out into the community um, 
I think that's what to say to you. We are trying to run as much business as usual as you would do in the safest possible way um, with lots of advice and guidance to staff about um, PPE and all that kind of, um, as you would expect us to do. Of course, some of our worries are more to do with just the health of our staff as they continue to go around in the community. Um, we keep quite tight tracks on that through our business continuity planning that happens twice a week. Um, and staff complete a kind of template that helps us to know um, what are actual resources, who needs to be shielded, who needs to be looked after in order that we can have them safely look after our children. I'm happy to take any questions in the same way that Annie has done, um, but you did ask me to be brief, so it's nice to meet you and there you go. Nice to meet you too and again welcome. Um, so can I hand over to the Commission if we have any questions? I think we're going to have to, we, we don't have much time so we might have to restrict it to about four questions I think. Um, and can we take two at a time? Does anybody want to start us off? Okay, um, Councillor Shawhan and then Councillor Potter. Yeah, I've just got a quick question about the well-being of children. I mean, teachers are much better organised, so they're doing live lessons. And I just want the impact on children, like watching a, a computer monitor for five hours a day. Is there kind of any study into that? And also being isolated at home without any kind of support. They might be a bit nervous to actually speak online. So I'm just concerned about the well-being of children. Thank you. Can we also take the question from Councillor Potter, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, and my question is um, to Annie Gammon as well, and it was about how you're prioritising, in um, sorry, I'll start again, in terms of the advice you are giving to schools in terms of how they can prioritise the children coming in because, because of what you said, you know, in uh, some uh, cases the schools are struggling to cope with the numbers. Could you talk a little bit about that actual advice? Thank you. Um, so uh, the first one about well-being of children, there is actually um, quite a lot of um, advice out about how to make sure a child's day working at home has some variety in. In fact, I think I was on a, a call with somebody who's um, top end primary child was having a PE lesson in the next door room. I'm not quite sure what they were doing, but there, there is some activity. It isn't just looking at a screen. And I think um, our teaching colleagues are well aware and probably colleagues in this call are well aware that five hours looking at a screen, it, it, it's hard work and you can lose concentration. So there is definitely variety built in with either within a lesson or across the day. Um, so some work won't be a live lesson, some there'll be a recorded lesson which will have a variety of aspects of learning activities within it. Um, I think there is a concern about children's well-being and, and, and you know we, we know that children's home situation varies. Um, we know that referrals to mental health um, services are up, referrals to CAMS. Um, I think that, again, schools have learnt from what's gone before and the pastoral input. I know um, Justine is on the call and she was doing some input to the head teachers briefing this morning. Um, a very good example where um, the school starts off with form time every morning and the children have to be logged on and there's an opportunity to see that everybody's there um, and there is an opportunity for children also to have one-to-one um, -one time. Um, Justine might want to say something about that. Um, and then the other point from Councillor Potter about prioritising children. We said the vulnerable children have to come first so there have to be places for our vulnerable children. Um, and then in terms of the children of critical workers that um, children who have a lone parent get first priority, then children where both parents are critical workers, and then children with one parent critical work and one not. Um, and of course, there is a, a request from governments as well that if, if a child can be at home, they should be at home to uh, just lessen that social contact. Um, I don't know, Councillor Conway, if you want Justine to say anything about the if you could very briefly, Justine. Uh, I don't really, I don't know what to say. We, we, I think the difference this time round is that schools understand the, what, what this picture looks like. We went in quite blind last time round and it took a long time to kind of work out where the glitches were. I think we just know 
what to expect and how to engage faster uh, and therefore get the kids in and uh, work with them directly. And I think one of the things that has been in the press a lot is this whole thing about um, live lessons. Um, and one of the comments is about how students deal with that. Well, the best practice is just good quality teaching. Um, and if it's a live lesson or recorded lesson or slides, that in itself builds in some variety for the students, but also we're mindful of staff as well as students, as well as parents. You know, it's a very complicated picture and one size fits all has to be something that we try very hard to avoid and giving the flexibility to both schools and individuals within schools to make sure that engagement is happening in the right way for them, I think is really, really important. Uh, and that's the kind of support that we've been having from Hackney, that, that they know that we know our schools best and we know our communities best and encouraging us to do that in the right way for our communities is what works. Thank you very much, Justine. Um, I have another couple of questions. I've got, I'll take these three questions, please. Um, I've got Councillor Peters. Um, I also have Councillor um, Gordon and Richard. Can we start with Councillor Peters, please. So there has been, thank you very much. There has been a, a lot about um, uh, the digital exclusion of many households, both in terms of um, uh, children uh, maybe not having laptops, uh, but also uh, those families not having um, a reliable um, Wi-Fi uh, connection. Um, and indeed, it's um, often um, highlighted that um, if that's the case, then um, uh, access to the internet being done through pay-as-you-go mobile phones is tremendously expensive. Can you tell us what the, the need, do we know much about the need in the borough, um, the supply of laptops, either through um, uh, funds from schools or from central government, um, and um, uh, what we can do in terms of maybe extending um, uh, Wi-Fi to, uh, to homes and promoting um, online um, connectivity for, for families who don't have it. Thank you. And Councillor Gordon? Um, Councillor Peters has broadly asked my question. I was just going to add that I am aware that some schools are doing fundraising to try and support these efforts. Not all school communities will have the same resources in doing that. Thank you. Thank you. And lastly, um, Richard Brown, please. Uh, just to answer the last point, um, Erswick had 235 laptops delivered on Monday. Obviously, completely coincidental that I'd done an interview with The Guardian on Saturday uh, where I said, uh, why haven't these arrived yet? They arrived on Monday uh, mid-morning. Uh, they do take some um, processing and setting up. And so basically you can you can issue about 50 over about a three day period, or at least we can in terms of ICT capacity. Um, just something more generally, you, you know that Erswick is a site right in the middle of Hackney. It's, it's open plan pretty much. Um, I wonder if the council um, can do more to uh, educate local people who are not parents. Uh, every day we get shouted at when our children are out on break time, uh, saying that they should be wearing face coverings, for example, uh, which is not true. Uh, then there's no guidance that says that children outside should be wearing face coverings. Uh, we run a daily mile, which is um, outside of the school, around the perimeter of the school. We're doing that every day as a good piece of uh, exercise and mental well-being as well. Uh, I was shouted at the other day during the daily mile saying we shouldn't be letting our kids out and I should be wearing a face covering while walking with the children. Uh, this isn't about parents. Uh, it's about residents that are not parents and something, anything that the council can do to just explain uh, that uh, schools are doing an incredibly valuable, complicated job, both remotely, but also with vulnerable young people, uh, because I, I really don't expect to be shouted at uh, in these circumstances, and I'm afraid I am being. Thank you very much. Um, Annie, can I just slip in one other question because we've, we've got two about digital divide and, and the last one was about messaging around social distancing. But I, I wanted to ask a question about um, our early years providers because I'm aware that some of them are, are working at reduced occupancy at the moment because um, 
they're prioritizing um they've done their risk assessment and they're prioritizing the spaces to a limited number of young people how how are they going to um manage financially um i know obviously you've highlighted the issues in terms of the census but just in terms of the the reduction in in income um how how are they going to manage that Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Um, though, so the digital exclusion, are, um, are, well, it, it was it was an educated estimate was that we needed two thousand laptops. Now we know that some of that has been filled because, as Richard said, some laptops arrived. What had happened was that there'd been an allocation for schools last term that they could take up if they had to send children home to self-isolate, send bubbles home. So some schools had already taken up their allocation, but some hadn't needed to. Um, we have looked at the whole list of allocations for Hackney. I think there are only five schools remaining to take up their allocation, but a number have taken up just in the last few days. So we think um, some of that gap has been filled. But of course, it's a bit of a moving target because what might be a working laptop one year won't be the next year. And we know um, from colleagues that what Wi-Fi can work sometimes, but doesn't work at other times, particularly if you've got a, a family with a number of children accessing uh, remote learning. Um, we are working with our colleagues in the council's IT team to look at the range of offers from broadband providers to make sure that we can get advice out to schools that they can pass on to parents so that if there are good offers around, if there is free Wi-Fi for families with children, that, that can be taken up. Um, we are also going to do um, an additional survey to find out what, what the gap is at the moment for schools, just a simple survey. Um, I think, um, I'm sorry you've been insulted, Richard, or shouted at uh, on your your journey. I've seen you doing the school, mi the mile, um, the daily mile, and I think it's quite admirable. Um, I, I think there is something to say about what's happening in schools and settings so that the wider community do know that um, children can't, aren't socially distancing necessarily, they're in bubbles, so they shouldn't expect to see 100 children all gathered together, but they may see 15 children gathered together. Um, so we can look at that in terms of our comms. Um, and the early years providers, it is a worry. There is some of our early years, the smaller ones, some of our child minders and the nurseries, which um, have very few children, have decided not to open and they are able to furlough staff. And interesting, the language around this has changed slightly in the last week about furloughing. Um, so they can do that. But I would say that the financial certainty is partly dependent on that census um, and that being sorted out. Um, but, it, but it's an uncertain picture for colleagues working in that area. And um, I don't know if Councillor Woodley wants to add anything about the um, campaign, I think, that you're waging to get the government to make a decision. Well, uh, yeah, sorry, just, just to say there is a very clear ask, which is to halt the census and to maintain the, the funding that was maintained in July based on the previous January census and that seems a very clear and easy way through and I, I have to say I've just been expecting that to happen it just it just felt like delay um, but I understand from the debate this afternoon which I didn't have time to follow into but I will catch up with that um, the, the under, under secretary Vicky Ford has promised that further information will come out with sort of ideas around how to manage uh, the, the finance which it's frustrating on the one hand because it sounds like we're not going to have the simple solution that I was hoping for, but um, I, I, I guess I'm raising it because I think sites build on Richard's point about how we reassure our, our, our staff, our workers, our wider community in what is a very fluid and fast changing situation. I think of the work that Councillor Bramble and the Mayor were doing around primary schools, uh, you know, and then the, 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 the massive U-turn we saw between Monday and Tuesday. You know, Councillor Bramble and I and the mayor are working our socks off now trying to figure out how on earth to support early years. And, and there was guidance came out late on Thursday evening. There's more guidance coming out now, we're promised very, very soon. It's, it's very difficult. And obviously what we don't want is for everyone to lose confidence in government or in us or in one another. It's certainly not shouting at teachers and children in the streets. You know, what we want to do is move very quickly into a more stable position and offer reassurance. And that's and that's what we're working hard to do. Thank you very much, um, both Annie and um, Councillor Woodley. I just have one last um, very brief question for Annie Coyle. Um, and that is about um, the COVID-19 um, 
pressures on local authorities in finding appropriate placements for looked after children. Um, there have been a couple of articles floating around about um, about young people being placed in in inappropriate um, unregistered settings, um, looked after children that is, and I just wondered whether um, we have any assurances that the providers that we are accessing are all registered with Ofsted and are of good quality. Oh, uh, so I, I you open a can of worms in terms of the national picture around placements for children. Um, in terms of the Hackney position, um, we haven't had any children through the COVID experience that are placed in unregistered uh, placements or any any children particularly impacted significantly by that. Um, all of our children are managed through the Children's Resource Panel um, that happens on a Monday and it's a meeting that I've taken over chairing in terms of some of the placement requests or some of the legal intervention that we need to we need to make. Um, can I give you assurance that we don't end up there? I think it's a really tricky water ahead of us um, but I think that one of the certainly the approach that we've taken is how do we stabilize our children in their in their current uh, situations and safely. So um, yesterday, for example, well, we had a kind of hour and 15 minute conversation about a particularly uh, vulnerable young person. And actually what we've done is rather is to avoid the, his foster placement breaking down um, by, by putting lots of resource into the foster placement and really supporting the foster care, um, which is actually the way that you manage um, com complex needs around placement sufficiency. But it is an, an absolutely national picture and, and, and Hackney are one of many authorities that will face some of those challenges. Right here, right now, uh, we haven't got any specific issues that have been impacted by, by COVID-19. Okay, but can, can I just ask if you envisage that there, there may well be? Because it, it sounds as though it's, it's that you're appreciating that it's a difficult situation, that there may not be any guarantees. Could you just sort of explain to the Commission what under what circumstances would it be appropriate or not appropriate or I suppose would would, would you feel forced sure. service to place young yeah. people in unregistered settings? I think sometimes when we've got some they're always really delicate um, decisions to make and and um, placing children in unregistered settings without really understanding the impact of that or assessment is the wrong thing to do. The approach that we've adopted is um, that actually that always be um, a last resort and where it where it may need to be taken um, is how we would absolutely support it's about the child's care plan if they were ever in an unregistered placement so not the the registration itself um, is a particular challenge of course the plan and how we support children should we ever end up there is the more important um, things for us to focus on as we because some children um, where there may be really high complexity about how we're able to place them, um, then th I can't say never. No. So um, what I'm saying to you and giving you some reassurance about is that the wraparound support plan for that young person um, will be our most uh, important uh, focus. So it is never our intention, but I don't want to give, lead you down a path that says we will never place children in an unregistered setting. It would never be a first choice and we have to think about what's the right decision for that child. An example might be where we have a young person whose behaviour, um, for a whole range of reasons, sometimes in relation to contextual safeguarding issues, places that young person at significant risk. But we know that for children like that, in order to, what holds them isn't placing them somewhere else in the country, but actually the relationships that they have uh, with their family and with supported others around them. So it may be for a short period of time that that particular young person that it would be more appropriate for us to wrap around them in order for a short term period to find the right stabilizing experience for them because relationships are the things that keep children safe and um, it's not the situation we have at the moment uh, in terms of impacted by COVID-19 so please let me give you some reassurance about that but it is about we have to take um, each child's uh, challenges um, in their own right and think about what's right for them, um, always with a radar to um, the risks associated with unregistered placements.
Thank you very much, Annie, um, but also to um, Annie Gammon. Um, I'm going to have to sadly move on to the next item because we're already running over quite considerably. Um, so moving on now to item four, um, children and family service budget monitoring. Budget monitoring is a key function of overview and scrutiny and the Commission reviews in-year budgets of services supporting children and young people. The Children and Family Service have produced a budget monitoring report for 2020-2021 which highlights key budget lines for children's social care services. We have 25 minutes for this item, although I'm I'm going to see if we can cut that down in light of, of the fact that we went over for the previous item. So can I ask officers to present key issues from the report for um, five minutes, please, um, which will leave us with um, about hopefully about 10, 15 minutes for, for questions. I'd like to introduce Naeem Ahmed, the Director of Finance, Children and Family Service, um, Annie Coyle again, and Anne Canning. Um, should, we, should I hand over to Naeem? Coyle, I'm not sure who's Cou actually. Councillor Conway, I've sort of had to step in for Naeem. Okay. You said, yeah, hi. Um, good evening, everyone. Happy New Year to you all. Um, nice to be with you this evening. Um, by way of very brief introduction, whilst I'm certainly not new to Hackney, having worked here for a, well over 15 years, I am new to this directorate, very new in fact. It's only been a month or so. And um, Naeem, as Councillor Conway said, was supposed to present to you this evening, but um, something has come up, he's unable to attend. So I'm a last minute stand-in who probably knows less than many of you, but I'll tell you what I think I know. And if there are any questions at the end that remain unanswered, um, I am more than happy to follow these up and write to uh, Martin afterwards. I should also say that I haven't had a chance to have a proper introductory meeting with Annie Coyle, who might want to top up what I say with a bit more me meaningful um, substance, even though Annie is quite new as well, but Annie would still have a better grasp of um, cost drivers um, than, than, than I would. Um, I'll start, I'll be quick as Councillor Conway said, in, I'll start with resources um, available. The, um, referring to the report, the 61, 0.5 million pounds that can be seen from uh, table 1a of the report um, if you look at the bottom of the third column from the left that represents the council funding invested into this directorate or this part of the directorate as well as um, the social care grant of um, 4.6 million mentioned in a couple of places in the paper um, and £7 million pounds, um, agreed use of council reserves, which can be seen in Table 2. Um, these three sources of funding, totaling approximately £73 million, pounds, make up the primary financial resources for the directorate. Regarding the current forecast, if you refer again to Table 1A, the um, uh, the table that straddles um, pages two and three. The column third from right shows a um, forecast overspend of £3.6 million. Um, it, and in terms of the main budget issues and risks, um, if you were to choose to look at it this way, the director in total would not be in a forecast overspend position in the current year. Um, if there was no overspend in corporate parenting. Um, of course, that statement takes account of a significant reliance of, on grants and um, reserves, um, which is normally funding that should be um, temporary. And um, you don't have to um, do a lot of focused reading to come across information that tells you like special educational needs and disabilities funding, which I've come to speak to you about before, that children's social care finances is an area of significant pressure experienced by uh, many local authorities across the country for a variety of um, regularly reported um, reasons. I'll move on finally to um, management actions. Um, for management actions, 
Um, corporate parenting items are highlighted in table um, three. Um, and the final um, paragraph in the paper makes reference to each residential care placement costing the council um, £200,000 per year. So some of the previously discussed and ongoing work regarding um, early intervention and prevention will, if successful, um, also have a positive impact on the um, council's financial position with regard to um, children's social care. Um, I think I'll stop there, Councillor Conway. I don't know if um, Annie or Anne would like to add anything. No, I think no. it... Questions. Okay. Great. Um, can we then move on to questions from the Commission? Do we have any questions? Um, Councillor Etty. Thank you, Chair. Um, Happy New Year, everyone. And thank you for the brief summary. Um, looking at the summary position, I mean, I have two questions, but I'll just take in one after the other. Um, with regards to the 1.6 million reserves that was that's been set aside for additional staffing, with regards to, and you said them um, for offset, it was used to offset overspends in the children and fab. Is the I just want to know the 1.6 allocation. Um, has it been spent on improvement required by Ofsted? Or has this been used to offset other budget pressures with regards to that? The addition, the 1.6 million additional um, staffing. And I have a great concern. I, I will leave it to that question for now, so that then I'll come back because I have a great concern with regards to the corporate parenting budget. That's a very great concern for me, the 7.4 million. And I think it's something we've been discussing before, you know, where we'll have to look at um, um, future realistic ways of reducing, reducing the cost and other alternative ways that we might use to reduce the cost. But I'll leave my question. Or can I go ahead, um, Chair, to ask the question now? Um, yes, because I can't see any other questions. Okay. Um, so, I mean, with regards to the corporate um, parenting budget, it says there's a 7.4 million overspend before the use of reserves. I, I would like further clarity on that. And also, if we're looking at this demand um, in terms of increased pressure of places, is it driven by the costs of placement or what other alternative, like I said, cheaper options can we look into? And we're quite aware of what is happening with COVID. So more or less enabling us to think outside the box on how we can move things forward in future. Have we started to look into that as well? Because I know it's a lot of challenges at the moment, but I just want more for that information on that. And um, if I mean, if there are alternative, or is there a lack of alternative? If there are other options, cheaper options, you know, with regards to placing children um, in residential care. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Etty. Um, Anne is it? I, I don't know Anne or Annie. I don't know who would feel yeah, best placed to answer. The... Sorry, Councillor Conway. I'll I'll answer, and Annie can come in. Um, so. Councillor Etty, your first question about the 1.6 million from Ofsted. Um, and the, I suppose there, there was what the money was intended for and the fact that we've been living through COVID and a cyber attack during it. But when the additional money for Ofsted was given to the service, it was focused on two areas. One of which is during the period just before Ofsted, the pressure on the service at the front door in that November 19 period was particularly high and there was an increase in caseload. So a partition of that money went to deal with that increase of cases that have come through the system. Those cases come through the front door and some of which go on. So there was some pressure and I'd say, uh, uh, you know, units were an additional um, capacity was put in both access and assessment and children in need um, off the top of my head, about 900,000 of that 
additional monies. The balance of that went directly to address um, some of the um, areas for improvement for Ofsted. So they were um, things like um, increased capacity in the, um, you know, with an additional appointment of a reviewing officer, um, additional capacity at leadership level, additional capacity at data and insight, the appointment of a project manager, the appointment of an external challenge partner, and that on a full year's basis would come to about 600,000 or just over it. So five, between both of them, they're about the sum total of the 1.6. So just about 60% went on increased staffing and the remainder went on additional staffing to address the areas for improvement. So Councillor Essie, that's the first part of your question. Is that, shall I go on to the second part? Is that okay? Yeah, that, that's okay. That's okay Thank by you. me. So the second part about the pressures on lack and leaving care and the cost and value for money, et cetera, looking out, and it slightly develops from the question Councillor Conway asked about um, unregistered, unregulated settings. So there is extraordinary pressure on the system for quality, value for money um, placements, particularly for older leaving care, um, for leaving care and older um, looked after children. And that rather alarming figure of 200k is not atypical across London for one of those placements at the top end. So it doesn't take you very much money, you know, to add up how many of those placements and how easily you can increase the money. The budget structure is set up that you get a base budget and then you get reserves, which historically through the um, life cycle of the children and families budget, we've always taken um, a significant amount of our reserves. It's increased over the last four or five years from three million to just over four. But most of those pressures are on. Um, you know, there are some pressure in just the general volume in the service, but there are pressures on the leaving care and looked after children placements. We have set up some internal projects to look further back down the system about how can we reduce the pressure, but the main driver for that is about helping the young person stay safe and well and flourishing in their home setting. So we've got an edge of care board and a number of activities set up or we had set up prior to COVID and the cyber attack to look at this. So this is a real priority for the council. And if circumstances were different, we probably would be able to show some significant um, movement in that area. But I'm just, if I'm being frank with you, it's actually quite difficult. COVID has come across and for us, the cyber attack as well, but you're absolutely on the money as that's the area that we need to look at for the best outcomes for our young people, which then is also uh, has a value for money. Um, um, it, you know, it, it, it's it's also best use of council resources. Is it possible for me to ask how realistic is it for us to potentially have these services in house to be able to provide them in house? So, Councillor Conway, that's one of the things we're trying to look across London you know, um, to to offer with groups of local authorities on a regional basis to try and get some provision. It's difficult, it's expensive, it's the better long time answer and um, it, it's the real focus of certainly a number of North London local authorities to look at commissioning units across, you know, as in their totality. Um, yeah, so that that is you know, we all think that if we could do offer the placements ourselves much better, it's probably a parallel with having local foster carers that are known to us as opposed to going to independent foster carers, you're more yeah. in control of that. So that is one of the areas we're looking at, but on a regional basis, not on a local basis. Okay. Thank you. Um, do we have any other questions? So I've got Joe and I've got Councillor Gordon. Councillor Shawhan, your hand is up. I'm, I'm not sure if it, I think it's just stayed up. I'm not sure if you also have a, another question that you wanted to ask. Um, Joe and Margaret, start with Joe. Um, thank you. Just following on from um, that issue of trying to increase our um, provision in borough, I, I just had a question about 
why the Mockingbird project is cited as one of the management actions in, in cost reduction um, in the budget. I'm wondering, is that not counterproductive? Um, I wonder if you could just explain the rationale behind reducing that service. Thank you. Sorry, can, can, can we take Coun Councillor Gordon first? Then, yeah. uh, yes, please. Um, thanks very much, Chair. Um, I mean, the these cost pressures um, on children and social services um, have certainly been increasing, and you know, it's been very clear where the greatest cost pressures are in our services. Certainly, since the time that I've been. Um, involved in this area of scrutiny. I mean, I do appreciate it's a very difficult, you know, there's a lot of very difficult and challenging projects here. But I mean, I'm just wondering what you think are the, you know, the biggest challenges in order to reduce these costs and whether it's been given sufficient priority and really looking at the, the cost drivers, you know, and you've obviously mm -hmm. indicated a few practical ways um, mm -hmm. of solving them. But I mean, this is you know, I'm not trying to overstate it, but it, it is it does look like, you know, together with COVID, a fairly critical situation for the service. Just wonder whether you'd like to comment on that. Thank you. So thanks, Councillor Gordon. Can I ask um, Annie Cor, why, why don't you take up the Mockingbird project? Change of voice and I'll do the... Um, yes. Yeah, great. Yeah, I mean, that, um, so forgive me for not knowing how much you know about the Mockingbird uh, project itself. Um, I have quite a wealth of knowledge about Mockingbird nationally, and it's um, it's really fantastic to see that alive in in Hackney. And um, part of the reason why Mockingbird is cited here is because actually that's about how you create placement stability for children. Um, in that it, you know, the the whole model is based on um, a collaboration of foster carers and a whole range of children that mimic an extended family situation. So instead of um, children having to go to respite um, to another foster carer. You kind of go with your, you know, your foster carer auntie or your uncle and that sense of normality and emotional stability that happens for children when you just need a bit of a, a break because you, you don't accommodate children who don't have really big issues, really. And that the very nature of being in in our care is is on a backdrop of, of, of trauma um, and abuse and a whole range of um, um, other stuff that's happened to them. So, so the Mockingbird project itself is, is, I can't tell you, it's really delightful to see in Hackney. At the Corporate Parenting Board last night, there was a bit of a presentation about Mockingbird and uh, a kind of, um, you know, a vision that, that our in-house fostering service actually develops the model of Mockingbird so that we are able to stabilise other foster caring placements through that kind of similar adaptation of that model. Um, we know that our children are more stable in placements, the stronger their relationships are. Um, but we also know that the biggest test to the breakdown of placement is when children actually really test that. So um, I, I absolutely think that the, the mockingbird is a kind of invest to save. Um, it's a sense that you, you know, develop something that really works. It's got national acclaim. Um, yeah, I, I can't rate it high enough and um, really good for you to, to understand it in terms of in the longer term, that is absolutely how you prevent uh, long-term high-cost residential um, children's home placements for, for some children. So thanks, Annie. And the delivery of the Mockingbird project, of course, is, is wider across the council because often for a foster carer, it's an accommodation issue and they're very skilled at working say with older adolescents, but they don't have a room in a house. So that's kind of one of the um, the answers in a way to your question, Councillor Gordon, that the financial pressure on children's services, both here and across the, you know, the, the nation is, is, a, is a challenge. And um, the, you, you've asked about, do we think, I think you're asking me about, do we think we've got a plan about the reset? And I think that we feel quite confident that there are some really key things that we're working on very determinedly, despite COVID and the cyber attack that will reset the system. I'm not saying that they will be a panacea to all the financial pressures. And one of the most significant drivers will be is the 
engagement of our partners, both within the council and across the partnership in helping us resettle the system. Education in particular, but I mean, I'm also talking about police and health. Um, and there was a question brought up earlier about at the very start of this about, you know, health and well-being of young people in schools. And I know that our kind of local health system, you know, is a real driver in improving the health and well-being and it all plays through the system. So there isn't an easy answer, but we're very, very clear about trying to keep with early intervention, move in earlier, projects such as our um, edge of care board, such as mocking board, um, such as increase of um, local foster carers will better working with partners will all help this. So we have we have really got a tight plan, you know, and Annie and I could talk about it. Um, but it is a challenge delivering it in this current context. But it has not meant we have not taken our eye off the ball doing it. But some of these solutions are probably a national solution. It's a bit like we are a victim of the absolute paucity of good commission places out there at a reasonable price. They just aren't available. Um, if we're out looking for a secure accommodation, was it number 37 on the list, Annie, uh, last week when we were looking for a child that it wasn't even a choice? So there's enormous pressures in the system. But, some, mm -hmm. you know, there are national issues and there are some local issues that we've got, you know, a good grip on. And then perhaps maybe helpful for people to see, um, just last week we had um, three children that we thought we may need to put into secure accommodation. It's the most serious decision you can ever make to take away a child's liberty um, for, for, um, for their own good. Um, and really through a lot of um, front loading and creative thinking, actually for one of those children who was one of the 38 um, across London, um, on the day that a secure placement came up uh, for this highly vulnerable girl uh, who was only 14, um, actually we had also uh, had we had three plans in place how we could stabilize the current placement she was in um, and how we would look at a res the, res the option of a residential children's home but with the right plan around that and also secure but this particularly young person is highly highly vulnerable and very dangerous behaviors thankfully um, on the day that her uh, the the secure placement came up for for her uh, we had also been able to match her with a a residential children's home and um, it's really good for you to understand um anything between uh, 15 and 20 thousand pounds a week for a, for a secure accommodation in comparison to a residential children's home we were able to get that girl um out to a residential children's home and um, somewhere in aylesbury um she has kicked massively against the placement because clearly it's been a very big decision for her and I, i'm pleased to say that four days in she's really settled and started to talk to staff. And so just having a real kind of understanding about the nuances behind that, um, yeah, maybe helpful for you to have some detail sometimes. It seems to me, um, I, I know that this is something that we'll, we'll hopefully be tackling to some extent with the, the review that we'll be doing, um, looking into the, the pressures of, of accommodating um, adolescents who are entering the care system um, in our borough but it appears to me as though it might be an opportunity um, might be useful for members of the commission to perhaps meet with the teams who are making these decisions and to get a better understanding of um, what we're dealing with what what, what are these issues um, looking like um, and what is the landscape of um, provision what does that look like um, I think that might be quite a, quite a useful precursor for us um, ahead of any any sort of scoping exercises that we do for the for the um, review. Um, I just had one last question that I wanted to ask before we're going to have to move on, um, and that was just about um, with referrals to assessments into children's social care reduced by one third. Can you provide any further detail as to why there is a forecast overspend of four hundred and sixty one thousand in um, assess and assessment team? So even uh, the, the referrals have gone down considerably. There's no question about that. But actually, the journey of the child through the services, um, Councillor Conway, has not been as fast as it might normally be because some of the, in you know, and, and in some of the um, services that we would need to work with that child and that family to deliver to deliver um, uh, adequate support before we'd make a decision that actually it would be safe to return have been delayed slightly more complicated 
particularly during the period um, um, with um, with schools closing. So that the the throughput through the front door has been down, but the throughput out through the other end of the system has not been at the speed that we would like it to be in order to do it safely. I think the only thing I would add to that, Anne, is that sometimes numbers don't can mask complexity in yeah. terms of the needs of children, um, and that uh, you know it's a kind of well-worn path. Is that sometimes when your numbers become reduced, you become less frenetic, and you see much more of the um, intervention in relation to need, harm, and risk. Um, but yeah. So we, we've done quite a lot. That's, you know that that question you've asked, Councillor Conway, is always is very pertinent because we've done quite a lot of investigation on that. Well, why if that hasn't happened, doesn't it move through? You know, but it's a whole variety of reasons. Thank you for explaining that. And I just wanted to clarify one point. Uh, and I heard Annie um, speaking very highly of the mockingbird. Um, but I, so I just wondered why it's been therefore identified as an area that that. Um, the, so where we'll it, be reducing funding um if no, we I, I think it's i'll have to go back what it should say is the mockingbird is a catalyst to reduce funding not the okay. reduction in the mockingbird yeah. and okay. I'm, i've been trying to rumble through my papers here on screen to see it's not at okay. all about it you know if, uh, corporate parenting last night as annie said we, we presented it as a you know a, a, a real kind of special project in the scheme so it's not about that we've obviously not explained that clearly in the text Thank you for clarifying that. Um, and yes, just just thinking that um, the the follow up to this potentially would be for us to yeah. ex explore the issue of um, these really expensive residential placements yeah. with the frontline workers who are having to make these decisions um, with with what seems like really limited options available to them. Um, thank you very much. Um, to all of you, to Yusuf, um, Anne and Annie for contributing towards that item. I'll now be moving on to item five, which is the City and Hackney Safeguarding Children Partnership Annual Report. The annual report of City and Hackney Safeguarding Children Partnership is presented to the Commission each year for review. I would like to introduce Jim Gamble, the Independent Child Safeguarding Commissioner, and Rory McCallum, Senior Professional Advisor from Hackney. City and Hackney Safeguarding Children Partnership. We have 45 minutes for this item, although again, I think we're, we're going to have to um, try and trim that somewhat. Um, so can we have 10 to 15 minutes to summarize key issues from the report, which will allow 30 minutes for questions or, um, from the commission. Um, so handing over to Jim, would it be? Yeah. Uh, yes, Councillor Conway, thank you. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Just a nod from someone, yeah, Anne's got thumbs up. Yeah, well, I will attempt to, to be brief, although I'm not famous for my brevity. Um, so so the, the key issues, to, to, to sum it up, I think 2019-20 was a year in transition. Uh, we began as the Safeguarding Children's Board uh, and, and ended as the Safeguarding Children's Partnership. So that was with the imposition of the Children and Social Work Act following the Wood Review, where in essence the safeguarding arrangements changed. And that was placing uh, the responsibility much more firmly uh, with the three lead partners, uh, the, the, the local authority, um, I, 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 the police uh, and, and others. And so in essence, the transition uh, that took place um, occupied most of the first part uh, of that year. Um, and by the end of the year, the year in transition saw us going from um, moving uh, the systems, becoming more agile uh, under the partnership, answering uh, more readily to the three partners, CCG, uh, police uh, and local authority, uh, but then going headlong into COVID. Uh, and, and I think it would be remiss not to, to touch on that. I think the partnership uh, utilised the flexibility that the new Children and Social Work Act framework uh, provided really, really well. It demonstrated very early um, that we were able to flex. And what happened is when, as COVID came in and the reality began to sink in, uh, we first of all considered as a partnership, do we need to step back? Uh, are our meetings too bureaucratic? Are we drawing people from the front line um, who need to be concentrating on direct delivery uh, to talk about things 
that whilst they matter, don't matter in the here and now. The irony in that is that actually we found that we needed to have more frequent meetings, uh, but they needed to be shorter and more focused. That's exactly what we did. We created a contingency oversight planning meeting, bringing all the partners together. Uh, we refocused uh, our strategic priorities down to three key areas. Number one, the health and well-being of our workforce. And those of you that have been here for a number of years will recognize that that's always been a priority for us. But never was it more important in our pivot uh, to deal with the contingencies around COVID because without a healthy workforce, we wouldn't be able to deliver the support we need to make sure all of our children are seen, heard and helped. So that was the, the, the first strategic aim. The second was to recognize that there'd be new trends, themes and patterns in, in so far as safeguarding went, as we lost line of sight, direct line of sight on our most vulnerable families, we needed to consider how we as a partnership um, could flex to ensure that we had adopt different practices. One of the examples that, that we looked at very early on uh, was, was something we'd seen in Spain and France with regards to domestic violence um, victims, those coercively controlled during lockdown. And we have some examples of that in Hackney, but I, I, I'll not go into the detail of that now. Suffice that, that one of those cases is, is currently under review by us. But in essence, what we, we learned by looking at these trends was that we needed to build contingency so that individuals who were vulnerable uh, could indeed access services. Uh, and and some, of the, some of the partnership approaches to that in the aftermath of our experience, um, I think were really innovative. Uh, and I believe that Home Office and others will be picking up on it. For example, when police attend a call, um, examining the body worn video camera um, and so that they could see whether frontline officers were crossing the threshold, were taking into account the demeanor uh, of, of the victim uh, and any children that were present and any other um, in indicators uh, that in fact that person was being coercively controlled. Uh, and so there was a lot learned from that. And I see now the Home Office also have the Ask Annie a system which we discussed back at the beginning, which was about creating code words um, for uh, domestic violence uh, victims to be able to use when at a pharmacy, for example, so that they could indicate uh, using a code word that they needed to speak uh, to someone because they were a victim uh, of that type of control. The third thing we looked at was interoperability. So there's been a lot of talk about you know digital the schools pivot to digital and that's extremely important but actually pivoting to digital between the partnerships so with police not wanting to adopt you know the, the, the approach around Google Meets for a ver variety of uh, security issues others wanting to use uh, Microsoft Teams and others wanting to use Zoom so we looked at creating a, a framework and template that we would be able to ensure one uh, that we could talk to each other across the partnership uh, two uh, that the, the partners uh, would be able to engage uh, their own user group uh, effectively within that. And wherever possible, we'd be able to develop better standard operating procedures across the partnership uh, for engaging with young people uh, and their families. And in that interoperability approach, what we looked at was trusted communication vehicles. Because we know that when you pivot to digital um, and you are pushing people into that online space, that the risks uh, can increase and in fact you know the risks of fake news and thereby we developed a number of trusted channels one of those was our own Bromley Safer Schools app uh, which had uh, and still does a direct government feed on updates on COVID and push notifications from the partnership around those trends and patterns uh, as we see them develop indeed someone touched on children young people and screen time and the amount of it uh, that particular uh, app also deals with that uh, because, it, 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 in essence, um, I've just been prompted that I said Bromley, I meant Hackney, I beg your pardon. Um, but ultimately, that it tells people about the use of screen time and how actually different types of screen time can be interactive, they can be educational, and the breaks that need to take place. So direct advice uh, to parents. The challenges um, that, that we faced on the impact uh, were that we expected the workforce uh, to suffer uh, in respect 
uh, of some people uh, going sick, some people not being able to work. In fact, what we discovered was the opposite. People actually stood up, uh, people rallied, uh, and people across the safeguarding partnerships, whether it was in, in, in the NHS, in children's social care, in policing, in the voluntary sector, uh, they really did rally and went above and beyond. And that caused us some concern as we look forward about future workforce challenges, uh, for example, uh, into uh, potential P uh, TSD that we've, we've seen happening before uh, around mental health of those individuals who work at that capacity and under that pressure for a long period of time. So we've we've taken steps um, to learn lessons from, from that uh, and to apply them so that as we come out of, uh, I don't want to call it the second wave, when we as we begin uh, at the beginning of the end of this to come out, that we are monitoring and auditing indeed across all the partners uh, what the occupational health support is that's available uh, for their staff. I touched on uh, support systems uh, for families and young people. We've already had an extensive explanation uh, from schools about the sterling work they have done uh, to ensure they can support uh, as many children uh, as possible and indeed the steps that we've taken for those uh, less visible. Um, the mental health issues have also been touched upon and what we've seen uh, is a couple of trends, head injuries in young children, skull fractures, and we're not alone in that. That's a pattern that's that's uh, been evidenced across London, and we are um, linked with a number of studies thereby um, through the hospital to have a look at uh, what is happening there and what lessons we can learn from that. And we have a case of our own, as I've already alluded to, that's under review. We were prepared for a rise in online um, harms um, as they would impact upon children. We learned a lot of that from uh, the first lockdown. Uh, the National Crime Agency um, told us uh, through their policing contacts that there are about 300,000 individuals uh, at any moment in time who represent a sexual uh, predatory risk with regards to our children and young people. So we made sure that we were pushing out uh, information to help educate and empower parents about the measures they could take while young people uh, were spending more time uh, indoors uh, and online. And we saw a rise in, in accidents resulting from hazards uh, in, in the home. Moving on to more routine stuff, we carried out four rapid reviews uh, since uh, the new arrangements have come in. Uh, we have also commissioned a new safeguarding practice review, replacing the old uh, serious case reviews. And we have a number of, of legacy serious case reviews and um, one of which has recently been published and two others uh, which are about to be published. The question that arises most time at scrutiny, uh, in my experience, has been one of training. And, and what we've seen in the year 1920 is, is an increase, not just in the quality of training, but in, in levels of attendance. 93% of those who'd attended safeguarding training said it actually had a positive impact on their practice. So there are some figures, there are some attendances that are still too low, um, and, and that's being addressed. Metropolitan Police, uh, four had attended the year before, only three in this reporting year. That is always disappointing uh, because multi-agency uh, training is only multi-agency uh, when we have people from different organisations there. Um, but uh, tomorrow, uh, Rory will be delivering training to the entire Metropolitan Police complement to the FAST team. So we are uh, addressing those gaps. National Probation Service have been through difficult times. Uh, a key partner for us uh, alongside CRC, the Community Rehabilitation Company. And um, whereas in the previous year, only 11 of, of their staff had managed to attend training, 34 attended in this reporting year. Voluntary services continue to be one of our best uh, participants with 92 attending and children and family services have really uh, upped uh, their participation going from 241 to over 320. So if you look at that that improvement you'd think as we've gone into to lockdown in this year you, you might expect looking forward that we'll not achieve the same figures in training. Uh, the irony is of course with the new uh, you know approach of engaging online uh, I can say that we've had 800 participants uh, in, in our online training sessions over the last um, seven months. 
So as we've begun to adapt, as we've begun to pivot to digital, um, there have been some real benefits. And I think for us moving forward, our strategy will be a blended provision in future. On some of the other issues to do with business as normal, I give evidence to ICSA, uh, the Independent Inquiry into Child Sex Abuse, uh, on faith-based settings uh, over this reporting period. And as many of you will know, um, we've been involved in this now for, well, for over seven years. Uh, there, unfortunately, is a cycle where we have continued, I believe, to constructively engage. And uh, when I began uh, this work, we were engaging with Rabbi Pinter uh, later on um, with uh, Mr. Lobenstein and um, Rabbi Rothfeld. Uh, and at each of those stages, what we've done is we've tried to engage the community uh, in a sensitive and sensible way uh, so that we can ensure that any young person at any uh, unregistered but educational setting uh, in Hackney is receiving the same level uh, of safeguarding oversight and scrutiny. And, and you know, whilst we went and I gave evidence there, and we evidenced all of the steps that we'd taken, I have to say I was disappointed uh, as I watched the response that followed um, my evidence around yeshivas. And, and it's right, I think, to share this with you because I felt that our approaches were represented uh, as being um, overbearing uh, and insensitive. Uh, when for the last six or seven years, I think we've produced massive amounts of evidence to the contrary. And so I, I, I remain frustrated at that. I've mentioned it in the annual report. We need to drive this forward. Um, and, and whilst best intentions, I think, are always there, pushing the best intentions to the point whereby we are able to say, we know where all of these locations are. We are satisfied that the safeguarding training is meeting the standards required, you know, and we are positively and constructively engaged. We're just not there yet. And I know you have this on the agenda, so I'll not linger any longer, other than saying there are some good early indicators coming out of the Art of School Settings project, but um, I'm not pessimistic, but I I am cautious uh, and believe that, that we really need to continue the pressure from uh, council, uh, from uh, officers, uh, and from the safeguarding partnership to make sure uh, that we don't let this lag and, and come back to another scrutiny next year where I'm saying exactly the same thing. Ofsted engaged um, with uh, Hackney um, Children and Family Services. There were a number of issues drawn out of that and a number of issues from the partnership's point of view where we as a partnership really needed to improve how we support children and family services, in particular around strategy discussions. And we carried out a number of multi-agency um, practice audits, uh, and we were able to develop templates from that to help practitioners. And we're currently developing uh, a range of videos in partnership uh, across uh, the safeguarding community, but in particular with uh, children and family services. In respect of private fostering, I think we've continued uh, to demonstrate innovation. Uh, Alan Wood is carrying out a review of the Children and Social Work Act uh, following his report and, and our innovation around technology uh, I think will feature well in the phase two review of that. Looking forward, uh, we want to strengthen accountability uh, through adopting something we're calling child uh, safeguarding statements and, and I'm happy to talk about that later but that's an initiative we'll be developing uh, where those chief executives of bodies who have a safeguarding responsibility sign a, a statement that their safeguarding is fit for purpose, and they do that every two years. Uh, and in order to do that, they need to carry out a self-assessment. Uh, I've become very conscious over the years that scrutiny uh, can sit in a number of places, and, and thereby different people with best intentions are examining and measuring uh, activity in different areas and what we have proposed uh, to our strategic leadership uh, board and we'll be meeting tomorrow is that in fact we create a scrutiny oversight panel that brings together all of those individuals involved in scrutiny from across the safeguarding partnership and within the council so that we can agree strategic scrutiny priorities that we complement one another uh, with regards to how we 
we provide an insight into key areas uh, and we believe that um, this will help us. Uh, we're focused uh, on FAST, we're focused on early help as we move into next year. And I think two things to finish, uh, we're definitely uh, focused and committed to driving a culture uh, of anti-racist practice. And we will be asking each of the partners to bring their statements to that effect to bear. We are committed to challenging uh, inappropriate behavior through any of the partners at any time uh, and, and in any place, because we want our young people to be able to learn, live, you know, and thrive in Hackney. And finally, I think it would be wrong for me to present uh, to the Commission without pausing uh, and putting on record the deep debt of gratitude that, that we owe, that we believe we owe, uh, and I think the public owe, and as, as an independent and thereby member of the public, um, the gratitude that we owe to everyone working and supporting our frontline safeguarding services. And that's not just the NHS, and I don't want to diminish you know, the support and the gratitude that we have for them. And I see the work they're doing, I see the sacrifices they're making, but the voluntary sector, the police service and educators. One thing that I have found too often uh, during the pandemic at different points is teachers being maligned. And in fact, anyone who knows anything about it knows they are in the front line of safeguarding, whether it's during the pandemic, you know, or at any time before. We've got special needs teachers going the extra mile where it is impossible not to put yourself you know, in harm's way around the virus. And I think it's really important that we recognize the entire safeguarding body, uh, those individuals from NHS, from policing, from children's social care, you know, from uh, the voluntary sector and from our frontline teachers. And we recognize and record our, our debt of gratitude to them. So I just want to do that formally in wrapping up um, my my overview. Uh, I don't know if Rory wants to add anything um, before uh, we open for questions. Nothing to add, Jim. Thank you very much, Jim, um, both for your report and for that um, detailed summary. Um, much appreciated. Do we have any questions from the Commission? Um, again, we're going to have to really try and be brief um, with these. Um, I don't have anybody indicating. Can I have... ask a short question? It's Michael. Can I ask a short question? Please? Okay, sure. Mr. Gamble, good, first of all, good evening. And uh, I wish everybody listening a happy and healthy 2021. You mentioned in your report just now that you would like to continue the pressure on the subject of safeguarding initiatives. If so, can I ask you uh, or to explain why a letter sent a month ago from Interlink to the Council requesting a meeting with the Council regarding safeguarding initiatives has not been answered? Interlink are waiting for a response, so can I ask you if you have any idea when they will receive a reply as to when they can meet you or the council. Uh, thanks for that, Michael. Um, well, uh, let me say this. Um, they will receive a reply uh, tomorrow uh, because I haven't seen uh, that letter. But now that you've mentioned it, uh, I will make sure that I do. What I would say to you uh, is that in our engagement with you, we have always been prepared to work hand in hand. And I think some of the work that we did around creating Yeshiva safeguarding committees uh, that would provide oversight uh, themselves, supported by us, is where we were right up to the point uh, whereby we were unable to put that forward because we couldn't accept that we would barter um, uh, you know, the safeguarding position vis-a-vis -vis, uh, dropping some of the national curriculum issues, which as you know, are outside our gift. But you know, if there is, is, is a fault on our part that there's a letter sitting that we haven't responded to you, uh, to you at, uh, at this time, then I apologize for that, but I will give you an undertaking that tomorrow you will receive a response and we will be happy to meet with you uh, at, at any time this week uh, to discuss that. Jim, can I, can I, sorry, can I just come in here? So uh, the, the letter is about uh, safeguarding training and the delivery of training by interlink to the Haredi community. So I've had some uh, uh, email correspondence with interlink back in early December. Um, but just to be clear that that is the topic uh, that's uh, for debate. But um, Jim, I'll talk to you offline and we'll get a response back tomorrow. Thank you both.
Thank you very much. So I have a question from Councillor Peters and then I also have another one from Councillor Essie. Councillor Peters. Um, so uh, you mentioned in the report and you mentioned in your presentation just then that uh, there are uh, plans to create a um, uh, uh, an independent scrutiny board. Um, uh, I think the details in the report are fairly uh, high level. Um, could you fill them out at all? Uh, who would sit on the court? Uh, how would uh, the government work and, and, and that sort of thing? Can I take another question from um, Councillor Etty first before we get um, answers from Jim? Thank you, Chair. Um, in addition to what my colleague, that was one of the questions, but on that, thank you, Jim, for the detailed report. I have to be, I have to commend the report because going through the report from City of London and also from Hackney, you can see that there's a lot of work that has been done into putting this together. Under the new arrangement for the serious child safeguarding cases, um, do individual safeguarding partners in terms of council, CCG, and police, will they be able to determine which cases are that will be reviewed and or does the safeguarding partnership have any role in such decisions? Chair, can I ask one other question, please? I mean, maybe if I could just ask together and then I won't have to come back the second time. Very, or, very briefly. Okay, on page 59 on Safer Workforce, which talks about um, LADO, which is DSL in terms of um, designated safeguarding lead, um, and also DSL with regards to Hackney. You, it, it talks about increase, 16% increase of 266 referrals. I just want more details on that and what has been done or what other measures will be put in place to improve that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Okay, handing over for answers to those, please. Well, I'll take the um, scrutiny panel and I will allow Rory to look up page 59 while I'm talking and, and take that. Uh, and take that question. Um, on the scrutiny panel, the scrutiny panel is an idea that, that I have seen operate a, in, in another borough. And it's where the chair of scrutiny from the council, alongside the independent scrutineer, which is the actual label that the Children and Social Work Act gives uh, to my role, um, comes together with uh, those in the police responsible for internal uh, reviews, those in CCG and in health responsible for serious incident reporting, um, and indeed those within the likes of children's social care, where they're responsible for quality assurance and audit uh, and improvement boards themselves. And rather than each working in isolation, collaborating to identify what the common trends and themes around inspection are, informed by uh, CQC, HMIC, and other national inspectorates, and then to agree who is going to concentrate on which areas to ensure that we can um, complement rather than compete and confuse. And the idea of that is not to undermine uh, the, the hierarchy or, 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 the, or the role of anyone else. Uh, it is actually simply to provide collective oversight collective agreement and then a six month priority program of work where we all know well we're going to focus on the front door we're going to focus on uh, the hackney well-being framework we're going to focus on the process around fast and work that back into the other agencies and um, so you may say to look at ofsted or you may look at schools and say well actually the quality of referrals could be better and um, so would that form part of it a, a more intelligent strategy um, around how we carry out overall scrutiny. So that is is scrutiny and um, it does not take away nor does it diminish you know the the position of this group which ultimately as the elected body which holds us all to account but it is a forum whereby uh, we are able to eradic eradicate duplication of effort uh, and ensure that we are all better focused. The um, issue around the serious case re or case reviews. That's a well-worn practice uh, that we've had. It used to be called the Serious Case Review Subcommittee. Uh, with the imposition of the Children and Social Work Act, it became practice safeguarding practice reviews. Um, and, and they are slightly different 
Um, but ultimately, for, for the purpose here, it is when a case uh, arises which causes concern. So a case where we believe a child will have suffered significant harm, um, or in fact, where there may be, for a variety of reasons, learning for the partnership. Um, they will come to that committee, which is chaired by me, because I'm fundamentally independent. The police, um, schools, um, CCG, uh, health, all of the partners have a representative around that table, or can have. And each of them can present or challenge, but the ultimate decision about whether we commission a case rests with me. Thereby, you cannot have a partner who thinks, well, we don't really need to review that, making that decision because they don't want to, or because they have a vested interest, or because they think, well, there have been no mistakes made there. This is a, a well-worn and well-oiled process uh, that I think has allowed us in Hackney uh, to really reflect on what we've got wrong in the past uh, and, and to improve from it. But it is chaired by me. The fundamentals have remained the same. All of the partners will have a representative at it and cases will be presented. They'll be discussed. We'll query whether they meet the threshold. If they do, the local authority will inform uh, the national panel and we will set a set of terms of reference and appoint an independent author. Um, and if there's no questions on the panel or the, the case reviews, I'll let Rory deal with the question on page 59. Great. Uh, yeah, thank you, Jim. Uh, so, Councillor Essie, the, the, the numbers, I, I think when we look at uh, kind of the uh, numbers of referrals that are made, uh, whether it's in allegations against members of staff or, or those volunteering uh, in the workforce, I, I think we would tend to see a, a trajectory upwards as a positive move in the right direction. So, uh, yes, there's been an increase from 200 uh, six I think in 1819 to 309 referrals in this reporting period um, I think as a partnership we would kind of promote that and say well actually maybe awareness raising uh, around the need to report those concerns into the local authority designated officer um, is better uh, there is more awareness about uh, the behaviors uh, of professionals or volunteers that might raise concerns um, not all of those cases end up being full-blown strategy meetings or result in uh, disciplinary actions, say, for example, against a member of staff. Um, but nonetheless, I think the, the, the upward trajectory around concerns uh, that are reported to the LADO uh, it, it tends to be a, a good thing. Um, uh, I, I think it's really just highlighting extra awareness as opposed to there's any inherent uh, sort of growth in concerns about professional behaviour uh, in Hackney. Thank you very much. I, I now have questions from Councillor Joseph and Councillor um, Gordon. Councillor Joseph? Can you hear me? Yeah. Can I, yes. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Thanks. Thanks very much for that. <clears throat> I mean, um, safeguarding must pose some real unique challenges um, during this time when when children aren't being seen um, as much uh, by people in the wider community or, or by teachers. Um, I'm just wondering uh, what the safeguarding partnerships views are on the decline in in the number of referrals for children's social care, um, and I'm also wondering. I mean, to what extent can we sort of think creatively about um, how to, to get oversight of children that are maybe stuck at home in difficult situations? Um, to what extent could a child self-identify as vulnerable and uh, come into school or, or perhaps seek help in, in, in that sort of way if they were in a, a difficult situation? Thank you for that. Um... Councillor Joseph, can we have the question from Councillor Gordon, please? Um, yes, um, thank you, Chair. My um, question covers um, some of the um, same ground. I mean, we can see on page 42 to 43 of the report quite significant variations in terms of children's um, protection plans. Um, you know, um, 
30% increase in March 2017, um, followed by a 39% decrease to March 2018. And as um, that's obviously quite his historic, but there has been um, from the Ofsted inspection criticism of Hackney's um, threshold in, in terms of child um, protection plans and other interventions. Um, there is um, an, you know, an ongoing internal review in response to the um, Ofsted inspection. Um, I mean, I was just really wondering what you were hoping to see um, in the outcome of that review, what um, changes that you've seen already and whether there are any further ones that you think we should make. Thank you. Okay, I will I will begin uh, by answering the, the question from the Safeguarding Partnership point of view on vulnerable children, uh, and then we'll talk to um, the issues around the changes from Ofsted, and maybe Anne or Rory uh, will want to to come in at that or Annie. Um, on the on the vulnerable children one, I think um, when I said to you when we pivoted in March, what we did is we we recognized there was a change in trends that children were going out of line of sight. Uh, and we realized that we would need to adopt better tactics, including the use of technology to get line of sight in children and young people uh, who were in homes where we had concerns. And we are aware through the partnership that those tactics were adopted. Uh, we are aware of, of some success around collaboration uh, with those who were still in the field, community health uh, and, and others for that. And, and ultimately, I think, you know, from, from our perspective, uh, we have seen that as it developed uh, a number of lessons around what works. So forming a contingency when you do have access to a child, uh, when you do have children in school, are you able to identify whether or not you've got vulnerable children in school? And we have been able to do that. I think this time around, uh, we have far more children in school with far greater line of sight uh, and, and thereby we have a far greater level of reassurance but also we've looked at A&E attendance, and we've looked at the stats that are coming out. So when there's A&E attendance, whilst we've found a degree of reluctance about young people going there, there are opportunities for safeguarding partners to engage and to check out whether or not children uh, are feeling uh, more vulnerable and providing a line of communication with them. And I think, you know, I'm happy to share, we had a lessons learned document that we created uh, after the first a series of meetings and then what we did is uh, we created a preparedness document so we we looked at the lessons we'd learned for example lack of line of sight and we wrote to all the partners to say in the first lockdown when you didn't have line of sight and wished you had you know now you need to take account of opportunities when you do when you are engaging with people in anticipation of going back into a lockdown and we completed that audit um, asking whether they had fully met, partially met, or not met the requirements. And one of those requirements was around vulnerable children and creating contingencies uh, whereby uh, that we would be able to access them or create triggers uh, where they could engage us. And I'm happy to dig out the findings from that and share them with you rather than just making them up uh, off the top of my head on that. But suffice to say, the partnership is alive to it. It simply isn't easy. Uh, schools are a key platform uh, for direct line of sight on children. The fact that more schools are open, uh, we, we see as, as being positive, uh, even creates pressure. And we expected um, we expected the reporting to go down initially into lockdown, and we anticipated it going back up uh, as people came out and began to be able to engage again. And I think that pattern has been followed across the UK. Um, does that answer your question on that first aspect? Um, so on the on the the issue around um, referrals, is that Rory? Do you want to take that? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, well, I, I mean, I, I guess the I mean the paragraph you're referring to sort of demonstrates a swing in child protection plan numbers from 2016 up to uh, the reporting year. Uh, in 1920. I, I guess when I'm looking at that data, what springs to mind for me is about the application of thresholds. Um, is that being consistently managed on a year on year out basis when we're considering whether children need to be subjected or made subject of the child protection plan? Um, rather than focusing on the specific point around CP plans, I, I think there's probably a 
certainly from my perspective, the issue of thresholds is something that does require focus by the partnership over the next kind of period. And by that, I guess where I would lean towards is what's happening at the front door as opposed to the data items that we're looking at with CP plans, which I think probably the 250 mark is, again, the data isn't in the report, but probably would be more broadly in line with statistical neighbours um, uh, than it certainly was when there was either 20% less or 30% or, or less. But the, 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 the key issue that I think the partnership needs to get to grips with is this front door issue. I think what we're seeing, and, and, and probably Anne and Annie would, would reflect this, and I think this is what Ofsted also picked up, was that there's far too much being referred into the first access and screening team that actually doesn't require any statutory social work intervention. Um, so there's a lot of resource and effort and time going into assessing families that actually maybe that could have been done at an earlier stage uh, without the engagement uh, of the social work teams um, uh, in the Hackney Service Centre. Uh, and, and that's a partnership issue because thresholds only work when the partnership understands them. Uh, and, and I think there are some questions for us at the moment about whether that is uh, fully understood um, and whether those thresholds are properly described in, in the documents and the policies that we have, and then uh, subsequently the practice that's happening on the on the front line. Thank you very much, um, Rory and Jim. Um, I've got another question from Richard. Do we have another question? Um, okay, uh, can I take a question from Anel, as we haven't heard from you yet, and then we'll also have um, one last question from Joe. Um, we may actually need to send you some questions after this meeting because I think there's quite a lot that we're hoping to get through, but I'm, I'm conscious of time. Um, Richard? Uh, I absolutely agree with Jim in terms of the importance of schools uh, in safeguarding, and obviously I would. Uh, but what about the increase of uh, families that are now electively home educating? Uh, some of those who are on child protection plans, how are we keeping track of those? And I would also say from direct personal experience, uh, the traveller community have to some extent uh, stopped engaging with education at secondary level. I've been trying to persuade various traveller families to return. And so those are two aspects that I have particular concerns about and hope the council can develop strategies uh, regarding. Yeah, I think on... Sorry. Sorry, can we just take an, a second question from Ernel, um, if possible, and then possibly a third from Joe. Ernel? Yeah, um, thank you, Jim, for your very detailed report. Um, my question is around vulnerable children that you talked about um, uh, so detailed in your report. Um, I'm wondering where does, um, in light of the increasing number of deaths across all age groups, where does bereavement counselling fit within the, um, is it to do with safeguarding? Because, um, you know, this is a very challenging and painful um, environment for all of us. And obviously we need to think of children who perhaps don't have an awful lot of support at home to deal with um, a loved one, a grandparent or a sibling, or even a parent who has passed away as a result of COVID. Where does where does um, bereavement sit and is there a demand uh, for, for, for um, bereavement support to vulnerable children and their families? Thank you, Ernel. Okay. And lastly, can we have a question from Joe? Sorry, are you able to keep up, Jim? Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, great. Um, Joe. Thank you. Um, I, I wanted to pick up on the point that Rory made earlier about um, the need for us to perhaps look at the threshold. Um, in place for accessing support and, and how that feeds backwards through the system. And um, in particular, in, in view of that, on page 56 of the report, um, the report notes a worrying increase of 73% in acute mental health admissions for children and young people via Homerton Hospital since the start of the pandemic. And um, I wondered what assurance do we have that local preventative and early help services are 
providing um, that, w that are provided through CAMS are accessible and appropriate and acceptable to young people and how well is the RAG system working in terms of prioritising those cases and connected with that is there sufficient recognition of the digital divide in terms of accessing um, digital support okay is, is that it thanks yes, okay in in the first one on elective home education i think actually annie would be best fit uh, to answer that yes i think um children who are on a child protection plan um, would be closely monitored by both the school and children's social care so if they if the parent wanted to electively home educate i think it would be very thorough follow-up by the elective home education team and chris roberts is here to talk about unregistered education settings there ehe falls under his remit as well and he may want to comment alongside the social worker so i think there would be close scrutiny and some concern i would say about the elective home education choice um, and as we know anyone who elects to home educate there does have to be an inspection um an assessment not an inspection an assessment of what education is being offered okay. I think if i pick up the travelers um point as well um we do have a colleague who works with the travelers and certainly amongst that community there has been real anxiety about the impact of covid so i recognize that uh, attendance at school has been below what we would want i would say that there is connect can, there are connections with the community and education within the community although it's not what we want and i can bring a report on that or have one sent out to the group okay okay richard and uh, then moving to the bereavement actually it's a really really uh, important question and it's something that we learned uh, in early march from our first uh, priority engagement uh, with regard to the lessons we were learning so we have sent comms out to all partners we have audited uh, their approach in school and um, so we've looked at, at this twofold one is do partners have a um, approach that where a member of staff suffers a COVID related bereavement that they put in place measures to support them and number two um, whether or not schools do uh, and I can share the feedback from that that audit um, with you but that's something we're alive to it's something that we prompt partners and remind them to do and it is indeed something we've we've audited uh, in that regard uh, from the mental health mental health and well-being of young people it's something that we are looking at you know a small number but but a high percentage uh, of, of admissions to to the Coburn unit we're alive to it we're looking at the provision I think there is a huge level uh, of, of, of pressure now being brought to bear and we are no different than anywhere else in the country in that regard and there's work being done about how quickly uh, young people can access uh, not just the assessment but the services that they need thereafter and in tandem with the early help uh, issue early help is one of the areas that we are committed to auditing uh, this year because that links directly uh, into what we some of the, the concerns we have around the application uh, of threshold and i know that rory has been talking to annie coyle uh, about that pathway uh, and pipeline into fast and and some uh, we, we are currently planning a, a number of initiatives about how we can best collaborate uh, to look at that. Uh, I don't know, Rory or, or Annie, do you want to add anything? I, d I just think other, to, other than just to kind of reflect, you know, since the pandemic, pandemic we, we know that there is, has been a, a really clear spike in concerns about the mental health of children young people you know that that was there at the first lockdown i think those concerns are there in in this lockdown uh, as well um i mean in the margins what we're trying to do certainly as a partnership team is raise awareness about some of those online go-to points that young people can access i think in the report i've uh, mentioned cooth uh, which is an online resource we know local cams partners uh, are also 
um, uh, prioritizing their visits alongside alongside similar kind of risk assessments that exist for social workers you know face to face for priority with PPE but actually some of those lower level um, uh, uh, children who might be suffering lower level emotional uh, and, and, and uh, emotional and sort of welfare issues uh, may not be visited as often as they would have been had COVID not been around. That presents a risk, but again, as a partnership, we're kind of alive to some of those issues through the contingency meetings that we've uh, that we've been held uh, that, that we've been holding. Um, no easy answers, um, but uh, again, I think that risk is recognised, and and frontline professionals are doing what they can to make sure that any any gaps that that are there are plugged. Thank you. Sorry, I was just going to. The only thing I would add is um, that we have set up a, a bit of a, a working group to think about the children who are in uh, acute mental health um, beds and how we make sure that that's the the right for, thing for them at that time, and then how we make sure that, that on discharge of those children um, that they're safely home with the right kind of wraparound support. Um, or, or if need be, um, and it's the right safety plan for them in terms of care arrangements. So just to give you some reassurance, that is something that we're um, kind of acutely aware of. It was really good, actually, Rory and I had a, a very good conversation just about the application of, of need, harm and risk and the difference of that. Um, the only other comment I would make is that bereavement, like no time other in our country, has become a real national issue. Um, I think the flip side of that is for the first time when children experience bereavement, it doesn't become a, a, um, a taboo subject. It's always been one of those areas where children aren't always allowed to grieve because it's difficult for adults to watch. Um, I think it's a real national learning. Um, and for our children who are um, who have a social worker uh, and are open to our service, of course, the Hack News um, has the a great resource of our clinical service um, we've got to be able to make sure that we use that service wisely um, but just to give you some reassurance that it's absolutely front and center of our thinking and just if I can add one final thing council just before I, 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 I'd be quiet the in the audit we did we looked generally at lessons so we looked for example at the great work done by the Homerton as a partner who looked at a an assessment framework for vulnerable workers, uh, for workers from the BAME community. That is now being used by other um, partner, safeguarding partnerships across the country. We looked at PPE. Have we got the right PPE for the right person in the right place doing a particular job? You know, have we got sufficient reserves? Uh, we did audit the bereavement issue, and as Annie says, because it is national, and some of the findings that we got from that have been shared across other boroughs. So we are alive to that. And just in, I don't see any hands up, I just want to finish by saying, I think we're very lucky. The the mayor is alive to all of the issues. I have one-to-one -one meetings with him uh, and the lead member. They're extremely robust. And, and can I say that in the, the new safeguarding partnership where responsibility for leadership lies with the police, uh, with health, and with the local authority uh, under the leadership of Anne Canning, and that nowhere is that leadership more manifestly delivered than it is by Anne Canning from Children's Social Care. We still haven't got it right. The police do not participate, I believe, um, as frequently uh, and as visibly as they always should. Um, uh, but Children and Family Services under the leadership of, of Anne has been a breath of fresh air. That's not to take away from our colleagues in CCG because they are going through, as the police are, a musical chairs in, in review uh, and restructuring. But I, I think as a council, we are very, very lucky to have the leadership that we do uh, in local authority from Anne. And I just want to put that on the record because very often what we're doing is we're highlighting what goes wrong and who doesn't get it right. And it's important just to highlight um, why sometimes things work because we've got someone who's prepared to reflect, not just on what has worked, uh, but on what hasn't. Thank you very much, Jim um, and Rory. Uh, I think the Commission has a, a number of um, other questions that we would really like to ask, um, but we, we, we've just run out of time. So I'm going to ask if we, 
if you'd be happy for us to send these questions to you um, and then we can publish the responses in um, at our next meeting for um, members to note um, if that's okay with you um, and the Commission um, but I'd just like to mention that the Commission welcomes the Safeguarding Partnership suggestion to move towards quarterly reporting as this would move away from historical discussions of issues from the previous reporting year. Um, can I suggest that the Commission meets with the um, independent chair to agree how best um, to take this item forward in the future? Um, okay, thank you very much for attending. We're now going to um, move swiftly on to item six which is unregistered settings in 2017-18 the commission reviewed unregistered educational settings in hackney and made a number of recommendations for improvement given the complexity of this issue and the difficulties encountered in making su sustained improvements the commission continues to maintain oversight and to review and monitor progress against the recommendations the education service have provided an update on unregistered settings in hackney which is available Available via the website link. We have 20 minutes for this item. Can I ask officers? Well, I, I imagine it will be less now, and, and much of that we've touched on um, in, in the previous item. And can I um, also ask um, officers to present for, for um, very, very briefly, as brief as you can be, um, so that we can have as much time um, for questions. For this item I'd like to introduce um, Chris Roberts who is the Head of Wellbeing and Education Safeguarding and Annie Gammon who is Director of Education. Um, I also assume that Rory and Jim um, from Safeguarding Partnership would want to come in on this item to update the Commission on the work that they've been doing in relation to this. Um, but first can we start with um, Education Service? Hi, uh, thank you Chair. Um, can you hear everyone hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, so my name is Chris Roberts, I'm a Head of Wellbeing and Education Safeguarding. I've been with Hackney since September, so this is uh, my first meeting of the Commission. So uh, um, I have to say hello to everyone and uh, welcome. Uh, I, don't, I don't need to sort of re rehearse the arguments and the known history around um, yeshivas and unregistered education settings. I'm sure the Commission are probably far more steeped in some of the history around this than, than obviously I am and know some of the background. But it's obviously very clear in relation to unregistered settings. One of the challenges around them is the definition that they are considered too narrow to be considered as uh, independent schools and they're by, by the definition of their curriculum they are considered to be uh, institutions of religious institution but also and many of the families who have their children being educated within unregistered education settings and yeshivas uh, when approached from us also say that they're home educating their children choosing to educate their children edu educate them otherwise uh, but whereas the curriculum also there is considered too narrow to be elective home education and that therein lies a, a challenge and a tension uh, because elective home education requires to have an element of secular education within it and then a wholly religious education would not be uh, have the breadth necessary for it to meet the definitions of either home education or school education which does bring up challenges around both the curriculum and the education some of these young people are receiving this uh, issue has been recognized by the department for education who just recently closed a consultation on changing this so it would bring uh, look at closing some of this any institution that is providing full-time education no matter the breadth of the curriculum during the school day would be required to register and bring them into a regulatory framework is being proposed um, in line with the uh, systems for independent registered independent schools. Um, though obviously for the um, commission needs, this would require legislative change and so I, I wouldn't necessarily expect a quick response or a quick change on this, regardless in terms of how the movement moves. So I don't think as a result, we should necessarily see this as being the, the quick solution or the short solution, but it does provide some of the issues and some of the questions and the challenges that have been raised by, by this commission over the years, um, maybe provide some longer term solution to some of the issues that, and concerns that we have. Um, in terms of raising, addressing some of the more direct issues of what we're doing in, in, in Hackney Education to address some of the issues, clearly we've got now in place that was launched in September our unregistered education set of protocol, which provides a, um, a multi-agency response, both in terms of the identification of new settings that when come along, or if there are serious incidents or safeguarding issues uh, that come to our attention that take place within that. Uh, that's been embedded now into practice. Um, at the time of the report, there was one meeting. We've now had two meetings in relation to unregistered education settings um, in, in response. And those meetings have been well attended by the partnership who've contributed to that. And we've had the multi-agency response, which I, I think is, shows 
good practice and progress in terms of how we are dealing with issues and incidents that arise within settings. Uh, looking to the longer term, uh, in terms of that, we are engaging through the Outer School Settings Project to try and how we can look at improve the safeguarding practice and get the assurance that we want uh, around the safeguarding practice that's in that. Uh, and in kind of been addressing the question that came up earlier, we met with Interlink at the end of October uh, to discuss precisely this issue and had um, raised with them around how do we talk about how do we look at the safeguarding practice within yeshivas, what kind of training offer we could look to develop to ensure there's a designated safeguarding lead in place in every setting and the steps that we could kind of take to get that assurance. So that 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 work has progressed. Uh, one of the actions that arose out of that to, to address the question uh, would be that a meeting would be facilitated with a representative from the yeshivas and that meeting took place last week. So there are steps that are in place and again, we set out kind of our roadmap in terms of what we kind of thinking was um, and looking at the relationship and how we can build the relationship with the representative and the yeshivas. And the aim is of the aspiration is that we, what we want to is make sure there's a trained DSL on every site. Um, you know, they have safer recruitment practices. You know, there is reporting about allegations about professionals and, and all the issues that come out through things like working together, keeping children safe in education are in place. And we have the arrangements to make sure there is that necessary assurance that we can actually not only it's there but we can assure ourselves it's there so that's that's where we're looking at it's very much early days in that regard and, and i know what jim and rory have said earlier that you know we've been you know, in this place and all but i think it was quite clearly reiterated to to you know the rabbi we met with you know that we need to see some progress on this and we can't go around you know talking about these things forever more but before things get more so i think i think that was, point was made but we're still at very early days at addressing some of those issues through the outer school setting project. But that's the aspirations in terms of building the relationships and the things we're trying to achieve in place through that. Uh, and as well as the protocol that then enables us to respond specifically to incidents. And then you've got the longer term aspiration around what the, the DFE are proposals when they're talking about longer term regulatory change around the framework for these types of settings. But uh, so, yeah, I don't think that's necessarily the short term solution. That That's probably 18 months, two years away at the earliest. Um, happy to take any questions. I don't know if Annie wants to come in with anything else. Um, if I could move us on to questions, because we're, mm -hmm. we're um, really quite significantly wow. running over time. Um, do I have any questions from the Commission? Um, if not, for the time being, can I start us off with a question about the closure of an independent school last year? Um, the school reverted to an unregistered setting, meaning that a further 387 children um, were now outside the regulatory control and safeguarding oversight of the local authority. Were these children automatically put on the elective home register? Um, and given what the local authority now, um, given that the local authority now has the details of the parents involved, mm -hmm. which was a barrier to the regulatory action before, what action has been taken by the council to support this group of parents to um, ensure that their children receive an appropriate and effective education? Yeah, if, if I'm honest, in terms of we've, got, we've made contact, previously made contact with those parents at the point that it came out to establish them. Where we have recorded most of those children is we record them in our CME register as a kind of subset of the children missing education uh, because of that, say, because, because their setting has now become an unregistered setting, the curriculum would be too narrow. We couldn't have the assurance around the elective home education offer. Where parents have engaged with us, and, 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 and some have, and they've been able to demonstrate that they are providing, supplementing what the education the child is getting at the, the yeshiva, but through a sufficient secular education outside of that, we enable them to move them onto the elective home education register, and we monitor through our elective home education processes. Uh, but the children, the other children, at the moment sit within our children missing education rather than with elective home education, because we don't have the assurance as yet. Uh, and, and we can't have the assurance because of the nature of the curriculum that's in the yeshiva that, that actually their, 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 their education being provided would be suitable and efficient within a home education context. Thank you very much for that. And while we're, we're actually on that topic of the children missing education team um, at the education service, what is the caseload of this team and how is it resourced? Um, I'm particularly interested in this in light of obviously the, in, the increase of uh, children um, I fall under their remit as a result of COVID. In terms of in terms of children missing education, there's kind of the re the regular children. Um, 
and kind of the regular churn of young people who move out of the borough. And th those numbers actually have been fairly stable and gone quite gone down at the moment. Uh, I haven't got the exact figure to hand, and I can give that to the Commission to, to look at that within that context. But that number, because there's not huge numbers of people moving around the borough, going back abroad, going back. So the, the numbers of children missing education in terms of com, you know, coming out of the role of schools in that regard is actually fairly small. The resourcing of the team at the moment is it's a, a 0.5 member of staff. Uh, we do have a one, um, vacancy we're carrying at the moment. We're just about to go to recruitment and that. And one of the, one of the things we're focus upon looking at that job is obviously a, a more significant focus around the 387 children that we know about to provide that assurance around that CME once we recruit to that post, but that's currently vacant. Thank you. Can I, can I ask a question? It's Michael. Yes, Michael. Uh, good evening again. In 4.7 of your report, you write, and I quote, those parents who choose to solely educate their children in the yeshiva are not providing a suitable education. I find the statement uh, very inaccurate and quite disturbing. Since yeshivas have produced thousands of employed individuals, both professionals and non-professionals, work not only for our community, but also beyond our community. So for where does your report writer get it that yeshivas are not providing a suitable education? Well, it's based, it's based on the fact the definition of yeshivas provide a, a solely religious education. You know, in terms of that. So if they're to be considered as elective home education, the guidance from the Department for Education states, the Department for very clearly states, a child, you know, home education should enable a child to participate fully in the UK, life of the UK, by including a sufficient secular education. So if a yeshiva is providing a solely religious education, by the de definition that comes under, you know, what, what comes under home education and elective home education or education otherwise, is that education has to be suitable and efficient. So if there isn't that secular component, we cannot deem it suitable. And that's, so this is very much within the sort of language that comes out of the Department for Education and the legal framework that sits around education otherwise, elective home education and the education being provided. Now clear, clearly, if yeshivas are offering a broader curriculum than just a, you know, just a wholly religious education, then they should be registered as schools. And, and be inspecting part of the you know, the inspection framework that covers with schools. And obviously then they'll be able to evidence to them that they are providing that much broader education that goes with them. But if we're talking about parents who are elective, you know, using education otherwise, then we have to rely on the definitions that come from the Department for Education guidance, which a purely religious education is not considered sufficiently broad enough for it to be considered suitable. Thank you very much for that, um, Chris. I, I just have two further questions that I'd like to ask, and then um, I, I think we're going to have to move on to the next item. Um, the first is that the Commission notes that um, an unregistered setting protocol was established in September 2020. Can you provide further details um, of this protocol and confirm whether the Metropolitan Police and the London Fire Brigade are included? And can you also provide further details of the Stage 2 incident which occurred since September, um, including what enforcement action was taken? Um, yes, both, both London Fire Brigade and the police are, are involved um, in, 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 the, in, the, in the meetings. Um, Fire Brigade attended the first meeting. We have a relevant one meeting I had today with them um, in relation to um, the police attended. Um, the incidents themselves, one were related to a fire in a setting, um, which subsequently transpired to be an independent school, but at the time we thought it was a new unregistered setting. The second one related to the one we had more recently, relate, related to the number of children sighted and a public health concern in relation to COVID, which is obviously a much wider issue that we have. Uh, as, as Annie mentioned earlier, in relation to the public health issues around numbers of children that are in settings, and obviously the issues around vulnerable children being able to attend such settings you know, if they can't access curriculum. But there was a report that around the number of children attending, so we convened a meeting to look at that. The, pro the protocol operates at two stages. There's a, a stage one, which is largely around if we get a report of a new site that we are not familiar with and are not aware of. Uh, in which case we convene a multi-agency meeting that sort of shares information around what do we know about that site, what do we look at it, and how do we how do we respond? You know, in terms of recording that, how we engage with that, what do we do with it? The second stage responds to any kind of more serious incidents that occur. So it may be a particular safeguarding concern, it may be an incident that happens within there that comes to our attention. In which case, again, we look at the convene the same the same people. We have a senior a point of contact in each of these services that comes together, and we have a named point of contact. And how we then address the issues that come out of that 
depends on our response and depends on the nature of the incident. So what you have, but they are multi-agency. And, and, and we'll, what we look to do is kind of look at the most appropriate actions that we need to take in response to that. Um, whether we need to engage with the setting, whether we need to different partners need to engage with social care or whether the police need to take action or whether the fire brigade needs to take appropriate action. Or in some cases, they're already doing that in, in terms of what they need to do. But that's kind of how the process works. So there's that two stages. It's the same people involved, but these are senior level officers that we have as uh, points of contact, both within services within Hackney the Council and within our partners from the CCG, from the police and from, and from fire brigade. Thank you very much, Chris. And my very last question is going to be about um, the, the um, commission notes that last year, the update, um, last year's update, that an audit of safeguarding arrangements at all, all out of school settings um, project was being undertaken, um, including yeshivas. Can you provide further details of the outcome of this audit um, as this will provide the Commission with some context as to how yeshivas compared to other out-of-school settings um, in terms are in, in terms of complying with safeguarding requirements and um, it would be really useful to hear whether other out-of-school settings are, are, are compliant. Um, I mean the, the out-of-schools project has done a whole piece of work around you know engaging with all, a whole broad range of uh, settings. I don't have the data to hand around the numbers and the level of engagement. I mean I'm quite happy to respond to that and give a report back to the Commission and as a, as a brief I wasn't prepared for that so I can I'm quite happy to yeah make some comparisons around the numbers around the out-of-school settings project and what and the work they've done there around. Thank you very much. Uh, Jim did you want to come in on that one? Yeah I just wanted to, to come in and, and first of all say that so, sorry am i talking over chris no no okay and uh, i just wanted to come in and say first of all um that, that michael lobenstein who, who's asking the questions uh, had done a lot of work with us had been entirely constructive uh, supportive uh, and helpful as we work towards trying to create a safeguarding committee that would be run by and owned by the yeshivas uh, and I just want to put on record my thanks to you for that, Michael, because I know that wasn't easy. Um, and I just want to say, and, and I want you to challenge me if I'm wrong, that the problem with that was uh, about curriculum, not about uh, engaging around uh, setting the safeguarding framework itself. Yes, you're, you're perfectly right, Jim. Um, we're working very hard to uh, um, to sort out the safeguarding issues that are in yeshivas. And I'm hoping by the time we talk next or we meet next, um, we will be a, a big, big stage further. Okay, and if I could just finish, Chair, by saying that, that, that obviously that creates an issue for us because we cannot negotiate the curriculum out. And I, we've always had a very honest relationship with Michael uh, and, and other uh, leading figures from the community that we've engaged with. My issue is when those who represent yeshivas meet with us and say that they're talking to yeshiva leaders and this isn't michael and um, when they meet with us they clearly know where these yeshivas are but do not tell us and that is not a situation that is sustainable and i go back to the position we had seven years ago when i said this will only be resolved by a legal instrument that actually places a requirement on unregistered settings to uh, be, once they're designated as schools by the local authority, to behave in that way. There needs to be a legal framework. Otherwise, I am willing to guarantee that this time next year we'll be having the same conversation because the curriculum will not be reconciled. I mean, I think one of the challenges try, trying to have it, and I, I agree with you, there is the, the safeguarding issues and there is the curriculum issues. Uh, and, what, and one of the challenges of why, what you end up with is, particularly in relation to not by not registering, is the cur curriculum issues, because the curriculum issues, they go underground and you have those issues. But what you also then is, you, you know, what surface goes under the surface is the safeguarding issues. Uh, and the conversations we've had so far is about, let's focus on the safeguarding issues, the curriculum, put the curriculum issues to one side, you know, um, because they're separate, but if we can surface the safeguarding issues and respond to the safeguarding issues appropriately, we can at least try and get that assurance around the systems that are in place and the process. We can then have separate correct discussions around curriculum, which is a separate issue, I think. 
Thank you very much um, to all contributors um, towards that item. Uh, I think we're now going to have to move on. Um, now moving on to um, item seven, which is the cabinet member question and answer. Um, relevant cabinet members are invited to the commission each year to respond to questions within their portfolio. Deputy Mayor Bramble, the cabinet member for children education and children's social care is attending today to respond to three policy areas identified by the commission. These are published in full in the agenda, but in summary, these are firstly addressing how COVID-19 has impacted on the number of children being electively home educated and the arrangement that we have um, in the council to ensure that these children are receiving an appropriate education and effectively safeguarded. Secondly, with reduced oversight of children, how is the children and family service working with local partners and local safeguarding children partnership to help identify and support children at risk? And finally, assessing how COVID-19 impacted on the provision of extracurricular activities and what role the council can play to develop and improve young people's access to local sporting, cultural and other community resources um, as the pandemic eases. Can I ask cabinet member, um, can I ask that the cabinet members speak um, to each individual question for um, a couple of minutes each, ideally, um, and then we'll have a few minutes for questions after each. Um, now handing over to Deputy Mayor Bramble. Thank you so much, Chair, for having me here this evening. I just want to begin really where Jim um, left off to thank everyone in education, whether they are a governor, a parent, a young person, a teacher, teaching assistant, whatever role that you play in this time during this pandemic, I just uh, commend and thank you for all that you are doing and continue to thank you because there is nothing natural or normal about living through a pandemic and it's really important that we acknowledge all the work that goes and sits behind that and obviously Annie and the staff team that have been working relentlessly with schools um, and that helps me in my role, I'm deeply appreciative of that. So since March 2020, we've had about 166 children that have moved to be in home educated chair. And what we've seen from March and December gone is about 45 referrals for families to want to use um, this service. This had a significant impact on the service, as you can imagine, due to the influx of parents wanting to make that decision. There has been complexities on how we go about making those assessments. I say we, I mean the staff, because due to the restrictions on um, COVID, um, parents were quite anxious, obviously, about what those arrangements would look like. Uh, but staff have been working tirelessly to think about how you can have those assessments and making them safe and meaningful still. So uh, they've happened in a variety of ways, not always in the context of the home when weather was better. They've been out in the local park, for example, and thinking about how you do the assessments there. Some have moved on to online platform to assess um, children and families there. So just really thinking of differently about carrying out those assessments, but in a way that is safe and compliant with COVID um, guidelines and restrictions. That assessment typically takes about 12 weeks um, to come to pass. There's a website that parents can go to for information that is quite handy and has all the information from um, the DfE and also our policy on elective home education. And um, while that and um, parents, there is a number as well that parents can get in contact um, if they want guidance, uh, but I suppose it's important to highlight that actually if a parent decides to home elect their child that actually they then take on the responsibility for that child's education and also are there to offset any on costs whether that's around private tuition or resources that that child may need at any given time i just got to remember to check the timings chair because there's lots I want to share with you. Um, uh, what what that meant in staff terms is that there was a part-time member of staff working on it. There's a member of staff that is full-time on this to be able to support children and, and families in, in the learning, but also to ensure that um, as a council, we're getting through those assessments um, um, in, a, in a timely manner and in a meaningful way. 
and we've got about 148 children that are on the elected home register at the moment and 24 young people from that have returned to mainstream education. I would say that it's I suppose the biggest referral came uh, and that around September 2020 and that coincided um, with schools open back open now I wouldn't say every parent that made that decision made it because of that but equally I imagine that there were parents when schools began to reopen with all the changes that was happening in schools around um, the, the pandemic that parents made a decision that they felt was the best for them and their children so the, on the 17th of December, uh, 289 children remained registered and receiving home education. The, there's a framework from which young people are and the family are assessed, and that is in three categories, and that's suitable, requires improvement, and is unsuitable. And depending on the degree of where you're graded depends on the degree of the assessment. So, for example, if it's if it's suitable, um, um, some some recommendations um, may be shared, but there is definitely nothing that's action for the parent, and an annual a review will be set up. If it requires improvements, um, what will happen is that recommendations um, will be made, and um, officers will go back maybe on a six-month basis to redress some of those improvements. If it's unsuitable, there's an array of, of work that takes uh, place, Chair, that, um, so for example, it's looking at the, super, the, the suitability of that, that, play, that home and working through steps to ensure that that child is then getting the right um, information, at, right education at the very, very, uh, ex the very final stages um there, there can be a legal requirement that can be action but actually there's an array of contexts of things that are worked through before them there i think one of the one of the challenges that, that we that we face around policy is that children parents are not required to register being home educating their child to a local authority so while the local authority has a list of those children chair it is based on those parents that get in contact with the local authority rather than it being every every child children that are on a child protection plan or a children need plan um they are and can still be home educated. Sometimes it may not be in the child's best interest, but I think it's we don't take a blanket approach because there are some children that still can be home educated and that is supported well. I'll, I'll go on to, I'm conscious of time, Chair, so I'll jump on to extracurricular activities and then go on to children's social care if that's all right. I think that COVID has absolutely impacted extracurricular activities but I'd have to say that you know and I've got I've got declaration of interest I'm a teacher so I always think that we're innovative and try our best for children. What I would say in this time is that schools have worked really really hard to offset that chair so uh, many um, schools still have their breakfast clubs and still provide after school provision. I think what has presented challenges is because children are operating in bubbles and if anyone who knows anything about the school day in school life after school clubs are um, children mixed from different age groups with different interests so um, children wouldn't necessarily be in their bubbles in after school clubs so that creates a challenge for schools to be doing that I think that, you know, Richard was on the line and mentioned the um, daily school miles and lots of schools have incorporated that just to think about physical movement and help offset health and well-being with children and making sure that children are getting that the exercise. Our music team has worked really, really hard to get some online tuition and platforms where children can still play instruments and get um, supported. As you know, we uh, we haven't had one now because of the pandemic, but um, we had our yearly music event where all of our schools participate and schools that win get money to buy instruments. So um, Hackney and children being musical is something that is really still very important to us. But what um, national data has told us is that about 68% of schools are saying 
uh, in primary school that music and extra activities have been uh, sorry have been affected by covid and about 39 percent of that is in the secondary schools so what schools are trying to do is implement that into the curriculum in different ways as i mentioned um, before but it still becomes to be different what schools have done and and six forms are included in that is thinking about the online platform and what they have done and thinking about how they can engage young people in curricular activities through that medium which i think is so so important there's been an increased use of um, newsletters i mean those are things that normally used to go sometimes missing in a, in a book bag but actually now newsletters are so so important to schools we're also seeing more schools having assembly online and um i during black history season as we celebrate here in hackney i was able to go online and visit a few school assemblies and speak to children and young people and it was a really nice way to engage with, with children it, nothing can replace seeing children face to face in their everyday settings of course but in the interim an online visit um is is quite nice to do and um, um, some schools, I think Clapton Girls was one of them that had a um, World Afro Day, which was back in September, and they did some really, really good um, activities and had some really good dialogue online. Hackney Schools Board has been doing some work with our schools as well and thinking about how they can support them and they're doing some work around belongings and they will bring a report back to myself and Annie at a later date and it will come um, to scrutiny at some point as well. One of the last things I want to say is that during the pandemic I met with officers with the creative sector and I think there was about 50 different organisations that work with our young people around the creative art uh, arts and they talked about the challenges um, that they were finding but also talking about how they were working with children differently so for example an organization that would normally be working with young children on their costumes through um, for the carnival for example they were doing online exercises with children because at the time when the pandemic was when we first went into the first lockdown um, getting posts out to children wasn't as reliable so again working so so differently and then there was an array of work done through discover young hackney and lots of activities were online for young people to be able to um engage in that so just really wanting to commend the work of the voluntary sector and all that they've done and just to highlight how important that it is i always remember the odd i always had one child in my class that would strum the guitar or bang on the table and there was a clear balance with me having to manage my classroom management and allowing a child to breathe and be creative and I always remember that so it's so and so important that we keep the arts going in schools as well as we can so just quickly go on to children um, social care and want to commend the work that, that the um, safeguarding board is doing which is the city and Hackney um, safeguarding um, partnership that works alongside children's social care and the team have been working relentlessly and, and I know the chair said we can't go into detail about um, uh, the cyber attack but you're right but a staff team that is responding to a pandemic and supporting children and families and responding to a cyber attack and supporting children and families so I just want to acknowledge the work that they have done in the IC team team have been working on to ensure that we're doing the best by children and families so one of the things that the service has been doing is that children and families and, and education would were working more closely together and it's one of those kind of what are the good things that we keep and that closer working relationship between the two teams and having a list of children and what they understand about those children is key and pivotable young hackney did a lot of their work online so all of the activities and especially the mental health work uh, young people can call and speak to an adult if they so choose either in a group or on an individual basis and all of that is online and was moved online i know that during the summer we were able to offer some on-site um face-to-face -face sessions on the uh, in the hub but that was reduced but there was still a very very strong online offer there was work that has been done with our with our colleagues to think about how we work with schools and 
what what we understand about vulnerable children, although children themselves don't like to be called vulnerable. So what does our support look like for our, the children and families that need us most? I think something else to be said is what happens in the FAST team. So that's the first aspect screening team and how colleagues from education uh, were working together within that unit. And I know that some of the team from Young Hackney at, at one point were situated in that team to think about how we work with, with families. Now, it all, it all amalgamated and went through to the Central Council's COVID helpline. So it's, it's actually good to be able to talk about a joined up practice in practice. And what it is, is that basically when families phone up, there's people there that understand and work with families to think about what support is is needed i think it goes back to two things i want to say is that meant with the, there was a mention about health and well-being and annie and i had a, an in-depth conversation when we thought about information distilling to schools and one of the things that we were key to ensure was that there was a focus on health and mental well-being for staff and also for children and young people because I know that there was a mention about online learning and what that looks like and individual class teachers will think about the dynamics of how they get the best of children um, when you're online. Also there's something about ensuring that there's appropriate intervention with children and families and also that that they are not having to repeat themselves and what hopefully having those staff in that unit has reduced that so that we're making the right intervention as early as possible but in the least evasive way because one thing that children and families especially parents are telling us they don't want to have to keep giving the same information over and over again and have to go through similar assessments so that is the one way that we've tried to mitigate some of that the data as you know showed that when children were out of school there was a decrease and then there has been a, a slight increase and um, with Sarah Wright when she was still here um, I was spending lengthy time in her discussion about how we respond to that and and where's the capacity in the system for us um, to be able to do that and now having those broader conversations um, with with Annie. I think that yeah, I mentioned the appropriateness of the assessments and I suppose that goes to a bit about what Jim was talking about as well, our intervention with families and what it looks like is making sure that it's as smooth as possible. We're also uh, looking at uh, using the working together safeguarding of children um, document that we have and ensuring that when we have the FAST team that it, it's an innovative thinking hub about, okay, someone's come through our doors, as a result, what does that three 160 degree turn look like when you have that child and that family as a result responding to that child as a result of responding to that family what does the context mean like for the lived experience for that child and where and how do we um how do we uh, cascade them or support them through the system i think rory also made a point about um referrals and doing that in a timely manner so all of that's uh, encompassed in there chair i'm going to pause there I think I could say more, but I think it's important to get some some questions is in. And as and when it comes back, because I was trying to race through, if there's anything that I feel I'm bursting to tell you, I will just add that chair. So apologies in advance. That's okay. Thank you very much, um, Councillor Bramble. Um, um, no, I've got to do it now. Sorry, Chair. One thing I didn't talk about is contextual safeguarding. We've got a unit now to ensure it's embedded because we want to go from this way of talking about contextual, guarded, contextual safeguarding as this innovation forward thinking way of working. It is, it is that. But actually, we want it to be in a, in a more meaning way so that it works for the majority of our children when you think those are at risk and at harms, especially when it it's at the acute end when some young children unfortunately uh, are killed. We want it to work for us in a more pragmatic way. So there's work going on that. And to reassure you, Chair, that the work for young children around settling their EU status is still ongoing. And um, a lot of that has been gone online due to the pandemic, but just want to reassure you that we are still working on that. That's the last thing, Chair, thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Bramble. Um, I'd, I'd just like to ask members of the Commission if we can take questions um, um, in themes. So if we can go with elective home education first. Um, Joe and Shabnam, were your questions relating to elective home education? Okay, great. Um, can we start with um, Shabnam and then move on to Joe? Um, 
Hi, thank you very much. Uh, Right, so yeah, um, I, the question that I wanted to ask was um, what support is available through the education service to help parents deliver education to their children, especially for uh, children with SEND needs? And Joe, can we take your question um, also? Thank you, um, Councillor Bramble. Um, I had a question about the demographics of the children that are moving to ho elective home education. And it would be really nice for the Commission to know what the breakdown is of those children by age, by ethnicity, whether they have SEND, uh, what the religious groupings might be. And in particular, it would be nice to know, is there an association between increased uptake of elective home education and household vulnerability to COVID? And also, is there any association between families of children with special educational needs? Thank you. Um, can I ask if um, Councillor Etty, if your question relates to elective home education? If so, if you'd like to ask it. Pardon? Yes, please. Yeah, okay. Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you to um, Deputy Mayor Bramble for the details. In You're a bit quiet, Councillor Etty. Can you hear me? Yes, but you're just a bit quiet. Oh, okay. Apologies for that. I said, um, I was just thanking Councillor Bramble for the update. In addition to both questions, um, for children that are moving into elective home education, in terms of additional support, is there any assessment that ha that is always done when it comes to the vulnerability? And is there any additional support that we give to, to them in order to support them and to support their parents so that they are effective, effectively safeguarded? Or you know, just to make sure there's not an oversight of any of any support that they might need. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Bramble, are you able to answer those three questions? So I'll answer some and Annie, Annie may have more of the, the detail of the break down to hand. Um, so I'll start with the first question. So there are there is support for parents with children that have special educational needs. As I mentioned before, there's children on plans and they will be supported at home. The major some some plans will depend on some of the needs that child may not be best placed to be home educated and are within school but when they are at home there is that support on hand and if they're at home and they have a plan they will be supported through in that way the breakdown of children what i, I as i said i'll bring in annie if if annie has that detail to hand what i what i would reassure um, members is that um 79 of the children that are home educated in the borough are with Within the, the a suitable category, which is um, which is the first grading, which is what we want, and and a smaller percentage are in the requires um, improvement, which is about fifteen percent, and there's a small minority that we're working through that are in the unsuitable. Um, Councillor Ette talked about what support there is um, for parents. So there's an array of support that is one on the website, two where officers are, are there to speak to them via phone, uh, three through the, the visits and the assessments that are, are there. And depending on the nature of the incident and what needs to be improved or where the parent needs supported will determine on how often that parent goes back. But there's lots of stages that where you work through that framework where parents are assessed that depending on what the need is, the, the recommendations are made and then they are worked on. Annie, I don't know if you have any of the figures to hand. I, I don't have figures to hand, but I would say that of the um, numbers who elected to home educate in September, when schools reopened fully, a significant number were choosing to do so because of anxiety about someone in the household uh, being vulnerable to COVID. Um, in some cases, perhaps the anxiety wasn't founded. In other cases, yeah, there are really genuine medical reasons. Um, there were also some families who decided to electively home educate because they'd enjoyed the experience of having their child at home, but the majority were related to a medical condition in the household. Um, the, I think it, some of the families, it was, did need to be made clear that there wasn't going to be home tuition. It is elective home education. It's for the, it is the parents' 
pretty much full responsibility to educate and the um the local authority is there as council bramble said to assess with some additional um signposting to support and a sort of helpline uh, but elective home education is what it says there isn't a, another tutorial service and i think a few parents did think maybe a tutor was going to come around and uh, teach their child but um i would also say that the schools where the child had been before worked very hard to make sure that parents understood what the change they were making um chris i don't know if you're still there if you know anything about the demographic breakdown but otherwise we can um send that through in the future not not immediately to hand i don't um in terms of again I, as I, I, can, I can provide that quite comfortably that's not a problem yeah i mean the issue is for parents is really it is elective home education is they're they're taking that on uh, and as we saw through the first time and, and a number of parents yeah, and as we saw there from that cohort that came out there was um you know 24 of them returned to education i think it was yeah returned mainstream education fairly fairly quickly uh once schools had opened who kind of actually realized this wasn't quite for them uh, and, and the full, fullness of taking that on um yes and there was certainly but and schools were very good actually in the outset in those early days uh rather than removing children from on roll for roll very quickly that they, they did keep children on roll so the children didn't lose their school places and, and enable us to have conversations uh, as well as the schools had conversations and say look you realize what this entails what this take you're taking on the fact you're losing your school place uh and then that, and then as well as the numbers that did take it forward there was there was a good number who who then having had that conversation decided to remain at their schools and school and schools are very good at not taking children off roll as, as soon as they potentially could um to to, to to reduce the number of children that might be missing from education so it, it did it did really you know it, at that point there was a concerted drive to try and keep children in mainstream education on, on both sides both in terms of our part and on the part of schools and I think it goes back to what I mentioned before when I said in September when schools opened back up that there was a, a rise and parents quite, quite feeling quite anxious at that time. But Annie and I had discussed this, I think, back in the, I want to say, the um, spring term, we had a discussion about elective home education because I think we both preempted that there could potentially be a rise around this because actually with all the decision making all the talks about schools is it safe is it unsafe what does it look like we sort of preempted and as I mentioned that member of staff the capacity has gone from half a day to a full day for, because as we anticipated that increase one of the things that i think is important to say though is that um through annie's team we had a discussion about how we work um with schools and and parents and if they wrote to me or annie or they were contacting schools we did advise parents actually speak to your gp speak to your school nurse get that information about you and your child so if you've got a concern because you are living with an elderly relative speak to your gp use the professionals to help you make an informed judgment you know don't 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 make that on your don't make that on your own we can't make that for you and that is something that we also try to do to ensure that any parent that was making that decision it was an informed decision and parents will choose to home elect their children of course but what you want to mitigate against is parents making that decision because they're anxious chair Thank you very much. Um, and Councillor Bramble, I just wondered, um, or, or, or um, Annie also, if you were able to respond to Shabnam's question in the, um, in the chat, um, where she'd asked quite specifically about um, having clarity on whether there is support in terms of resources and not just guidance for parents whose children um, do not um, necessarily have SEND. No, I, I mean, I can answer that. I mean, broadly, it is the parents have to take it. It's parents assuming that responsibility themselves around the education. So, but there are plenty as well as, as well as within the local authority. There are groups of a you know there are home education groups out there. Parents often tap into those with the home education community and provide that sort of mutual support that goes. And but in, in terms of the key key issue here really is by electively home educating parents are responsible for education. The responsibility of the local authority to some extent is around assessing that education to make sure they are providing a suitable education to their children the other the other bit i'm not quite sure if it got mentioned is what we've started doing also in terms of wider support for for families we're organizing a twice yearly sort of conference forum for home educating families that brings them together so we're inviting we had our first one back in november 
to I mean, it was a virtual one. So that, that does provide a forum where we as a local authority can engage with, with the home education community to provide. And, and, and around that, we talked about our assessment framework in that meeting. We also then spoke, did a, tra a sort of training session, particularly around online safety and online safeguarding in the current context. Because so, we know so many children are spending a lot of time learning online. Um, so we thought that was particularly pertinent. So there, there is a, a, we have the support and advice that we have. There's obviously community type groups and, and, and peer groups out support that's available out there that a lot of families do tap into uh, and also we're providing try through a sort of twice yearly kind of forum to provide those pertinent issues and address some of the issues that may come from the home education community through a, through a forum yeah and yeah chair it's a big responsibility for parents and carers to make that decision because as i said and, and as chris has correctly said the the responsibility of educating their their child and resourcing that education is incumbent on on them as i said if a child has a a, a plan or anything or statement in place that obviously stays with the child and those arrangements still stand but any additional um re resources or challenges that parents have um they lead on that and can just be guided and supported by by staff thank you very much um i think we're gonna to have to move on now to questions about um effective safeguarding of children at risk of harm um i have a question from councillor patrick um joe do you also have a question about safeguarding no okay. um, i'm sorry i thought i'd lowered my hand apologies okay, no worries um councillor patrick You're on mute. You're... Sorry. Um, it's about contextual safeguarding that uh, Deputy Mayor Bramble mentioned. I know it's a, a fairly new unit, but it's not that new. I just wondered how the unit worked um, across children's services, but also how it worked across the rest of the council um, with um, other parts of the council, like housing, like community services, like the gangs unit, etc. Um, I just wondered how it worked um, with that, with the rest of the council and our partners, especially um, the schools. Um, I also have another question in, in re relation to safeguarding, and that is about, again, whether we have a, a breakdown of who are we not getting referrals for now? I know obviously that, that, that many of the, the referrals that we're, we're the, the, the reduction in the fall in, in referrals is, is mostly attributed to schools but are there any particular groups that we're not hearing so much about you know in terms of ethnicity or children with special educational needs or any other protected characteristics so can you repeat the last part of your question please councillor conway just if if so we know that we've had a fall in terms of referrals um to children's social care but do we know if there are any particular groups who we, you know, who account for that um, fall in um, referrals, um, so do we know if there are any particular groups that we're failing to, we're not hearing so much about, or we're noticing any trends with? Okay, thank you. So in terms of the contextual safeguarding, you're right, it's a very new way of working. It doesn't replace anything that you do around safeguarding children. It's just a focus on when children are older and we understand the risk outside the home, how we do that. One of the things that the, the team are doing is thinking about how we embed this across services and then work with other services. So that work is has started but is needs needs more development councillor patrick and it's thinking about how referrals are made um clearly there has been some work done with schools and i know some of the schools had piloted the contextual safeguarding model and found that quite useful in terms of bringing young people together i know that there was some work was done um in the in in an area where it encompassed businesses so it's thinking about that so all of that learning um, has been revised, has been reflected on, been reevaluated to ensure that the, the unit now that's set up is how we deliver that and work across the council. But I'm happy to provide more detail of that in writing or come back at a later date. But it's 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 a work in progress. But I think the unit is more about how we make this. We talk about. Um, everyday business um business as usual how we make this concept 
a business as usual model now and that that is now ongoing but it's still very it's still very new i uh, we launched the unit and you launched the unit back in um the late, la later part of last year thank you councillor bramble it'd be good if we could actually it's with your permission whether we could actually have this as an agenda item at some stage um, in the commission's work um or i could have I think it's I think it's an important piece of yeah. new work that the council's doing uh, with young people that are vulnerable, and uh, I think it's perhaps something we should have a look at. But that's up to you. I agree, and, and and presumably the relevance of contextual safeguarding is sort of you know it's it's never been more relevant than now when we're having to adapt to the various different contexts in which you know children and young people are at risk. Um, you know, with now the home posing a bigger threat with children just uh, and online because children just spend uh, so much more time at home. But and I'm also wondering whether the council has been delivering training on on um, contextual safeguarding to officers. Um, I can't say that is anything that I am aware of just, you know, at, at the moment, but it may well be that it's something that I've missed. Um, yes, so there will be, I'm, I'm, I think maybe I'm what's coming. So there, there has been training, there is been training. So within the service, they are Im immersed in the training. And I went along to the sessions and spoke at one of the sessions where staff were delivering the training to their to their peers i think it's how we cascade that across um the services more what we're looking at now and did i think that you were trying to come in to comment um, thanks Councillor bramble council come did you you said to officers so we are doing training internally did you did you mean that did you mean to like a, an updated session for members or yeah i think yeah yeah to to, well, to council officers to ca council wide training the sort of council that the sort of training that's also offered to any partner agencies yeah. you know so, sorry to interrupt so there was um, a, it's what it's the training that council bramble attended and um annie attended as well there was a, a launch um with partners from across you know from across the services that we work for about two weeks ago it was oh, yeah. it, it was it was and in in that there was a breakdown of an under, a shared understanding of, of what it is a shared understanding of ways of working what are we looking to offset what do we think we can mitigate how do we understand children and families in the context of of covid but more broadly how do we understand children and, and families in that broader sense so i suppose what was helpful about that is everyone went away with a shared understanding and building on from what Anne said about the training is how now how we implement that um as a partnership and there's something to be said about how we hold children collectively in terms of our safeguarding um in terms of referrals i suppose it's you know the biggest our biggest referrals did come from um, um schools and when children weren't in schools we did see that decrease so you're talking of children between the age of school age so which is um four or five when they're in nursery up until when they're 16 so we had seen a drop in that in that number of cohort but it was then working with school so what um annie's team did alongside Anne no, Annie and Annie's team um, <laughs> did, is work with Annie, Anne and Antoinette. Oh my goodness. Um, how, what they did is then there was a bit more of a detailed work with schools around how any child that we knew to be vulnerable on that list what does that individual program look like so how many times would they need to be contacted by the school was there anyone else for example we, we've got young Hackney team would they need a call from them and that detailed piece of work and i you know i commend that work that's gone on actually because that would have take that takes quite a length of time all of that work done within schools so those children that we were um concerned about um we're we're supporting that way and i suppose your i preempt your next question what about the new children that we don't know we don't know there was always that broader conversation with the school is there any <laughs> child that you think um since they've come in are you concerned about is there any any family as well one thing as well chair it's important to say that even if we didn't know that that child was a concern any family that for whatever reason the school couldn't get in contact with um children services and hackney education were notified and then between the three organization thinking about how they reach and contact that family 
very very quickly um i'm going to have to ask the commission to um take a vote on whether we are able to everybody's happy to proceed beyond um 10 o'clock um i'm going to pr propose that we um add another an additional 10 minutes onto the mm -hmm. meeting um can you just raise your hands um if you are happy for this meeting to continue um, beyond 10. Is that okay, Martin? Pardon, I can't hear you. You just need, you just need the agreement of every, um, the majority to carry on. Okay, so can we just raise hands again or just establish whether that's a majority or not? I don't, I don't know if Councillor Woodley's like me sometimes still having to remind yourself that your vote in this doesn't count. You're not. Okay, so we are. <laughs> yeah, so we're fine. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I think we're going to now, because we're running so over time, um, I think we're now going to have to move on to um, questions and answers around extracurricular activities in school. Um, do we have any questions from um, members of the Commission on this one? Um, Shabnam. Thank you very much. Um, I, I wanted to ask, um, so with the reopening of schools in September, and I'm sure will be the case uh, once this lockdown is over, if it ever is, but um, there was less space given to extracurricular activities as schools kind of um, were anxious to, uh, for children to catch, understandably so. But I would like to ask uh, if there's been any recognition or understanding of how that reduced curriculum, extracurricular, extracurricular activities, has impacted children, um, particularly those who are less able to access the curriculum, so those with SEND or uh, with lower attainment. Thank you very much, Shabnam. And Councillor Essie, do you have another question? Yes, Chair. Um, I mean, thank you for that. Um, I just want to know in terms of financial help after, because after COVID, you know, that would be available for um, after school clubs and um, and other out of school settings that will have been impacted by severely by by COVID. Thank you very much. Uh, um, we would be handing over to uh, um, Annie for this one or Councillor Bramble or I can I can I didn't quite chair Councillor Eto was quite low. I don't know if you catch sorry. Me. I think I, I think she's asked. asked after about, school clubs and yes, finance. financial support for them um post uh, ones that will have been impacted um by covid um and what help is currently available to these clubs and how does the council intend to support these settings so i i i will i will respond and um annie may or may not want to come in um so in terms of the reduced curriculums are schools acutely aware of the impact of that on their children and i would say they're absolutely aware i think the challenge is around um spaces within schools um mitigating children it, the practicality of moving children around in a school building teaching them being covid compliant social distancing trying to do all of that within trying to meet the school day is is very very complex but i think that as i mentioned schools are being quite creative and have been quite determined to ensure that some of that extra extra curricular activities on the curriculum richard brown gave the example where he went out with his children and doing the daily mile and many children many schools are doing that if they're not physically taking children off site they're definitely walking them around um the playground whether it's a jog whether it's a walk um whether it's a run giving children that physical activity as i said the music service has worked really really hard to ensure that they can move uh, the ma majority of their support online, um, even to the extent of ensuring that there are tuition for children that are very, very musical or those that just want to explore music. Because, uh, 
you know, Hackney Education are really keen to ensure that that support and that um, extra lower activity is explored. And I think that your, I think if anything, PE would definitely be something that children continue to do because you want them physically moving, especially if some children are dialing in remotely as well and they're going to be sitting at a, a computer and they're not physically in the room. All of the um, social cues or the presence of a classroom that would help that child stay engaged isn't there. So you've got to think of a different way to captivate your online uh, audience and your physical audience in the room and actually being physically active is, is key to that and having those extra curricular activities. So I hope that answers your question. Yes, there is an impact. Yes, it has been um, slightly reduced in some sense, but schools are working really, really hard to either increase that or maintain it in a, in a manageable and meaningful way. In terms of financial support for that, Councillor Ette, no, but me, I'm sure the Mayor and I will be happy to add that to the long list of arcs from government the next time we write to them. What happens in terms of support with schools Ooh. is that their way, the way that they respond to COVID is all part of, sits within their, their core school budget. And we work with schools through Hackney Education and the Finance Department to help schools have a balanced budget. I know the, the government has given schools some funding around COVID, but um, like a lot of what the government does, we welcome when they do support schools or local authorities. But what we do find is that often enough, it doesn't go, it doesn't go far enough. So schools are trying to manage and respond to COVID in the midst of their existing budgets. Thank you very much, um, Councillor Bramble. I'm, I'm conscious that we've got eight minutes left before we'll have to um, close this meeting. So I'm going to have to bring this item to a close. Thank you very much um, for your um, answers to our um, questions. Um, so we're now moving on to item eight, child-friendly borough cabinet response. The commission made a number of recommendations to support the child-friendly borough initiative, including improvements to future um, consultation and engagement with children and young people. The cabinet response to these recommendations is contained within the link to this agenda where it noted that all recommendations have been agreed. The Commission has already seen how its recommendations have informed the development of the child-friendly special planning document and ha has now formally commented on proposals which were presented at the last meeting. There are a number of points worth mentioning here as successes for the Commission. Um, the first is the, the communications and engagement team are developing a toolkit to improve consultation and engagement with children and young people across the Council. And the second is that the statement of community involvement um, is a planning document which sets out how developers must consult and involve the local community this will now include specific guidance on how to involve children and young people in planning decisions as a result of recommendations of this commission. Um, now moving on to item nine, the work program. The work program for the remainder of 2021 is provided in the link to this meeting. The main change um, is that the next meeting of the commission on the 8th of February will be dedicated to looking at how we best close the attainment gap in, ha in Hackney. There will be external speakers from Education Policy Institute, University of Durham, other local authorities and local head teachers. The item on mental health scheduled for the 8th of February has been deferred to the following meeting. Um, the next item is item 10, minutes. The minutes of the last meeting held on the 7th of December are contained within the report pack. There are a number of actions from the meeting. The Commission has drafted a response to the child-friendly SPD proposals which were presented at the meeting on the 7th of December and submitted these to the cons consultation. This will be published in the next agenda. In relation to discussions around childhood poverty, further information is being prepared for the Commission on the discretionary crisis support grant in readiness for this for the next meeting on the 8th of February. Do members agree with the draft minutes? Agreed. Great. Agreed. Thank you. Item 11, any other the business? Um, the next meeting of this commission will be on the 8th of February 2021. I'm so sorry to have gone over to the extent that I have um, today. Um, there was lots to cram in, um, sadly, because we have a, a government that likes to, to change its mind at the last minute and, and sort of um, plunge us all into a position of uncertainty and um yeah <laughs> difficulty um thank you so much everybody for attending and um i look forward to seeing you um next month take care of yourselves 
Thank you, Chair. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Good night. Bye.